Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to call to order uh, this uh, meeting of the Capitola Planning Commission. I want to welcome everyone who's here this evening and who may be watching from home. Um, just an uh, announcement to begin this meeting is being Cablecast Live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T U-verse Channel 99. It is being recorded and will be replayed uh, next Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. The meeting can also be viewed at the city's website at www.cityofcapitola.org. And tonight our uh, technician is Lynn Dutton. With that, uh, we will have a roll call. Please, Jackie. Commissioner Newman? Present. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Welch? Here. Commissioner Westman? Here. Chairperson Story? Here. Will everybody uh, stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on our agenda uh, is oral communications. Uh, first, we'll begin with uh, additions and deletions to the agenda. Does staff have any requests for additions or deletions? We did receive two additional materials for item 5D for 4015 Capitola Road, a letter from the attorney as well as a letter from the um, architect. And those are available at the back of the room, and you each have one at your seat. They came in at 12 at around noon, and the second one came in at 5.30 p.m. this evening. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other um, commissioners? Any ad additions or deletions to the agenda? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to public comments. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Um, is there anyone there who uh, would like to speak on uh, some other item? So it looks like we're all here for an agenda item. So I'll close the public comments portion of the meeting and we'll go on to commission comments. Commissioners, I'll start with my left. Uh, just a reminder that this weekend is the uh, car show that's put on by the um, Public Safety Foundation. So it'll be a lot of fun Saturday and Sunday. Thank you for that, Linda. Uh, next, we uh, our staff comments. No comments. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to approval of the minutes. Um, this is the Planning Commission uh, regular meeting of April fifth, twenty eighteen, and uh, item number two, regular meeting of May third, twenty eighteen. Uh, maybe we'll deal with um, the April fifth first. Is there a motion to approve? Well, make a motion to approve them. A second. A second. Any member of the public wish to uh, comment on that motion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Sounds like the motion passes unanimously, Jackie. The next item is the approving of the minutes of the regular meeting of May 3rd, 2018. Uh, is there a motion to approve or are there any changes? <laughs> I'll, m I'll move uh, to approve May 3rd. Second it. All right. Motion and a second. Uh, um, any member of the public wish to comment on those uh, meeting minutes? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion <coughs> passes unanimously, Jackie. Next is our consent calendar. That's item number four. Uh, these are routine um, and generally um, uncontested items. Uh, um, we have. Uh, <coughs> two on the consent agenda tonight. Um, they're concerning 734 Orchard, uh, Orchid Avenue uh, and 4795 Garnett Street. Um, is there any commissioner that wishes to uh, pull one of these items? <coughs> Seeing none, is there a member of the public that would like to pull one of these items for further discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to... Um, Mr. Chairman, may I ask that you do them uh, one at a time? 
Yes, I will do them one at a time. We'll begin with 4A, which is 734 Orchid Avenue. Uh, is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve as drafted. Second. Okay, there's a motion and second. Uh, any hearing no further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously, Jackie. The next item is uh, 4B, which is 4795 Garnett Street. Um, this is an application for a design permit to add a new roof. Well, I will uh, recuse myself from this due to property in the, uh, within the distance. Okay. Um, I'll so, make the motion to approve it. All right, thank you. I'll second that. There's a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously with uh, one recusal. That brings <coughs> us to the public hearings for this evening. Um, and the first public hearing is uh, 5A. Um, and that's concerning a coastal development permit for property located at 620 Monterey Avenue. Um, and we will begin with a staff report. Good evening, commissioners. Before you this evening is a coastal development permit for the new school for additional school buildings at 620 Monterey Avenue at the New Brighton Middle School. Um, schools are not reviewed by the city; they're reviewed at a state level, and therefore we don't have much um, criteria to review this evening, other than whether or not it complies with the coastal development permit um, findings. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the application and what, what's being taken away and what will be put into place. And then the applicant is here with a presentation to kind of go through the design and the big picture with you. So this is um, within the public facility zone. And in this image, the red buildings, these are the ones on the top right are all modular buildings. And the center one is also a modular building that will be taken down. Um, everything outlined in red will be demolished within the application. And so again, oh, and the red was to be taken down. And they're going to be installing at the very top, um, oops, sorry. This building here will have classrooms. Then they're going to have a new building here that will have a wood shop, an art studio, and introducing two, a, a locker space and also a gym room. Um, over to the right. So with the, sorry, something's <laughs> having technical difficulties over here, touching <laughs> buttons, not meaning to. Um, so one thing we do look at within the review of a coastal development permit is parking. And the existing parking on the site is 148 spaces. With the new application, they've actually created two extra spaces, so it'll go up to 150. Um, in reviewing the application, we found that there's no increase in the intensity of the use because with the modulars being taken away and the new buildings coming in, there's actually a decrease of 1,268 square feet of classroom space. Um, and due to the, the locker rooms are considered an ancillary use because you don't hold a classroom in there and they're not increasing the occupancy of the site. Um, so that was the one item of review and I thought I would leave the design discussion with the applicant within their presentation. So with that, staff is recommending approval of the application for additional structures at New Brighton Middle School based on the findings and conditions of approval. Uh, before we, uh, are there any questions from commissioners on the staff report? No. Um, I, I did have a question, Katie, about, um, and I know we don't have, um, the usual jurisdiction over this project, but do we have the ability uh, to attach some conditions or findings about the process of construction? Usually we, you know, have some uh, conditions to help mitigate the noise, the times of uh, construction. We can, and I noticed in a previous application at this site, we limited the hours uh, Monday through Friday and I want to say 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Yeah. So okay. we could talk to the applicant about. And so we, we do have the ability to. You do have the ability. Make those requests. Thank you You're for welcome. that. Um, and before I um, ask the applicant to come up, I, did, I guess in full disclosure, um, I have a daughter that's graduating from 
New Brighton Middle School tomorrow. Um, and so, but since she's leaving and will not uh, reap the benefits of this new construction, <laughs> I don't feel that I have a conflict. Um, but I did want to disclose, uh, you know, my relationship uh, to this project. With that, I'll invite the applicant to come up and uh, tell us more about it. Uh, so my name is Andrew Fullerton. I work for Maddie Group Architects in uh, Santa Cruz, in the Sash Mill. Um, uh, we work for the district, uh, and the impetus for this project is basically uh, there was a measure passed in the November ballot 2016, Measure C, uh, to remove old portables, run down classrooms, and uh, prepare new classrooms for the uh, uh, for the students incoming in the 2019 year um, and uh, that's what we are attempting to do uh, it's a very tight schedule and um, as you'll understand kids uh, only have the summer off and and so the construction is going to take place uh, starting fairly quickly here uh, I think also some groundbreaking has already taken place uh, through summer 2019 um, so my, uh, my presentation is going to be fairly similar to Katie's. Uh, this is an uh, aerial view of uh, New Brighton School as it stands right now. The uh, areas in yellow are uh, portables that are going to be uh, removed from scope. Uh, they're going to be demoed. Um, some of these portables were uh, installed prior to 1980 and uh, generally they have a 30 to 40 year lifespan if you're really pushing it um, and, uh, and, and we kind of are here. Uh, so it's a great upgrade for uh, the students to get into new permanent classrooms uh, that can last uh, a longer lifetime and, uh, and be a generally better teaching environment. Uh, also involved, uh, as well as classrooms, are some facilities that um, the school just needs to run its programs. Uh, they're currently running uh, the uh, physical education department out of two old portables. Uh, that's the little yellow ones right beside the large gym um, on your right-hand side of your picture. Uh, those will be replaced with a... Um, state-of-the-art locker room uh, we're also including um, a mat room for weights that sort of thing and a dance room as well um, and that space can be opened up for uh, large groups that sort of thing um, in addition uh, the uh, yellow building to the right hand side is a group of four classrooms that's being removed uh, those are old portables that were installed in uh, part of almost the original school, the second iteration of the school in 1972. Um, and those have outlived their use. They'll be replaced with a, a state-of-the-art uh, art shop um, and also a wood shop uh, with, a st with a general ed classroom in between. Um, and then this was the master plan for the site, uh, which was developed with the district um, which shows kind of a future layout of the campus uh, where we feel and the district feels that it could progress to uh, in the future. And this is a layout uh, of what will be the new zero wing uh, is what the uh, is the classrooms uh, towards the um, east side of the campus. Um, six classrooms and uh, restrooms, fairly standard, um, all with uh, um, upgraded technology and good teaching spaces. And then these are the floor plans for the other two buildings. Uh, on the left hand side there's the locker room, um, two locker rooms and the uh, dance and mat room uh, towards the south of that. And on the right hand side you've got the art studio at the top the general ed classroom in the middle and the uh, wood shop uh, on the bottom. 
and there's some uh, 3D renderings of those spaces. The uh, top picture there is the uh, locker room and dance and mat studio. Uh, bottom left is the view from Monterey Avenue uh, towards the new classroom buildings. And the bottom right picture is uh, showing the uh, three classroom cluster with the art and wood shop. And you have any questions? No. Um, I, I had one question. <coughs> I, you heard me ask the question about, um, you know, if we had the ability to, you know, impose certain conditions just to protect the neighbors. I sure. mean, it's about, um, you know, the hours of operation, how early in the morning you can start, uh, and measures to mitigate, you know, like dust and things that go with particulates that go in the air. Mm -hmm. um, are, does the applicant have any issue with those or? or um, that we have had uh, a couple of uh, notifications from neighbors um, that have kind of spoken with our foreman on site mm -hmm. and, uh, and those have been taken care of by the contractors. Um, if there are any others, we'll endeavor to meet those. Um, I, I don't have any recollection of, of any complaints about noise. It was mainly about uh, dust on someone's birthday. Yeah. I think they were having a party or something. Right, so. right, okay. Um, so it sounds like that, that could be feasible, but I mean, um, yeah, you haven't started the construction yet, so, you know. Uh, some, uh, some construction has started to take place. Uh, there's been some ground oh. clearing and, and yeah. uh, ground works. Okay. Uh, well, thank you um, for your presentation. Are there other members of the public that would like to uh, speak on this item? Seeing none, I'm going to uh, close the, uh, um, the microphone and I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion uh, and action. I would like to clarify that the construction hours under the code are um, from 7.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. on weekdays and on weekends on Saturday between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so is, um, what are the commissioner's feelings on this project? Uh, well, I think it's a great project. It's nice to see these improvements happening up in New Brighton. Um, I feel I've had children who've gone through New Brighton mm -hmm. um, and um, it really could use some updating mm -hmm. and some new classrooms. Those portables <coughs> are pretty tired. So I'm happy to see that they're spending the money this way uh, to improve the school. I agree with that. I, I like the design. I think it, it's a good fit for, for Capitola. I don't have any issues with adding the conditions about um, the construction. I think that's probably a good idea. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm fine and in, in, uh, in favor of staff's recommendation to approve the project as it is. It, um, well, was it there a second? I guess I could motion? make a motion to um, <coughs> add the condition for our standard construction so that, that that gets adhered to and the neighbors can know that and approve the project as otherwise drafted. All right. Thank you. There's a motion. I'll second it. And there's a second. Um, with that, um, I'll, I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Um, congratulations, Th and thank you uh, for bringing this project forward. Uh, it's been, uh, the kids deserve it, and you know, and, and they will uh, benefit greatly from it, so thank you. Um, now we'll move on to item 5B. Um, this is uh, an application for an amendment, the master sign program at 103 <coughs> and 105 Stockton Avenue. And we'll begin with a uh, staff report. Thank you, Chairman Story. So tonight, uh, the proposed amendment is to increase the maximum sign dimensions and allow an additional wall sign for the tenant at 105 Stockton Avenue. The property is located at the intersection of Stockton Avenue, Riverview Avenue, and the Esplanade at the western entrance to the Central Village Zoning District. 
A master sign program in general establishes the allowed materials, letter style, height, color, and illumination of signs for multi-tenant buildings in the city of Capitola. An MSP is approved by the Planning Commission with subsequent approvals administered by the Community Development Director or his or her designee for signs which comply with the program. In 2002, an MSP was approved for 103 and 105 Stockton Avenue. That's Armida and the space next door. That MSP allowed uh, a wall sign located on the existing copper awnings in front of the business along Stockton Avenue, approximately 27 inches tall by 10 feet long, or 18 and a half square feet, with capital letters being 18 inches tall. Uh, it also allowed a wall sign located on the existing copper awning on the side of the business along the Riverview path, approximately 24 inches tall by eight feet long, or 13 square feet, with capital letters being 15 inches. Uh, the two current Armida wall signs, however, uh, in the locations described are both 24 inches high and eight feet long with capital letters less than 12 inches in height. The current application is the result of a code enforcement complaint. The applicant installed two signs at 105 Stockton Avenue without a permit. The two exterior signs are 32 inches tall by 96 inches long or 21.3 square feet. And the MSP does not allow a wall sign on the east elevation along Riverview Avenue. So the two signs are out of compliance with the master sign program. The applicant is proposing two changes to the master sign program. One, allow the tenant at 105 Stockton Avenue to have a second sign on the wall adjacent to Riverview Avenue and two, increase the maximum sign dimensions allowed under the master sign program to 32 inches tall by 96 inches wide, thereby allowing the signs that they placed. Staff supports the request for the second wall sign on the wall adjacent to Riverview Avenue because the applicant is on a corner parcel and allowing a second sign along Riverview Avenue is an allowance that currently exists for wall signs on corner lots in the Capitol Municipal Code. Uh, under that code section, businesses which are located adjacent to two streets or on a corner shall be permitted one additional wall sign to face the second adjacent street if the business is not identified on a monument sign as they are not identified here. So, SAP does not, however, support the request for larger sign dimensions. The proposed dimensions, which are illustrated by the nonconforming signs currently in place, are out of balance with the other tenant signs. Under the Capitola Municipal Code, a central village sign should relate to the surroundings in terms of size, shape, color, texture, and lighting so that they are complementary to the overall design of the building and are not in visual competition with other conforming signs in the area. Uh, the old uh, master sign program is also a little difficult to read. Uh, so what we decided to do is just sort of lay out a better formatted overall master sign program as the amendment. So the new MSP that we created involves several elements. One, each tenant is allowed to have two wall signs, um, or awning signs as that may be in this case. At 103 Stockton Avenue, signs may be located on the awnings on the south elevation along Stockton Avenue and the west elevation along Soco Creek. At 105 Stockton Avenue, signs may be located on the awning on the south elevation along Stockton Avenue and on the wall on the east elevation along Riverview Avenue. Signs may be up to eight feet wide and two feet high, which matches the existing Armida sign size. Signs may have up to two lines of text. Uh, text in the first line shall be no greater than 12 inches in height, and text in the second line of text shall be at least two inches smaller than the text in the first line. Signs shall relate to their surroundings in terms of shape, color, and textures, so they are complementary to the overall design of the building and not in visual competition with other conforming signs in the area. Signs on the east and south elevations shall be attached to the top of the awnings, the way they currently are at Armida. Signs on the west elevations shall be attached to the wall. Signs shall be externally illuminated, and that illumination shall be down-directed and shielded to light, the signs only and not light trespass onto adjacent properties. And sign applications that comply with the master sign program shall be approved administratively by the community development director. So staff recommends that the Planning Commission approve the master sign program as updated by staff and require the applicant to decrease the size of the existing signs at 105 Stockton Avenue based on the conditions and findings for approval. Thank you. Are there questions from commissioners on staff report? Yes. Um, so with the new sign program, um, the existing signs that are there would come down and they would submit new signs to staff for approval, one on the front and one on the side that conform to this. 
and staff will as part of that process look at the colors of the signs so that they fit with the building rather than the sort of stark white that's there right now which in my opinion um, doesn't fit with the sort of character and color scheme of the building so you will look at colors too that is correct okay thank you um go, go ahead okay yeah, well, first um the process here it sounds like you drafted a master sign program for the applicant uh, this is based on the existing master sign program with this language cleanup. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have uh, bought into your new version of their master sign program? or That's not what they requested because they were requesting okay. dimensions that match what they have currently in place that so does not conform. sounds so. a little odd to me that the applicant it proposes a master sign program and we prepare our own that master sign program for them, but... Uh, I don't know, I'll see what other people think of that. The other question I had was, what about the uh, vertical winery signs on the Armida side of the building? Those would be non-conforming signs. Um, we have not received any code enforcement complaints about those, and that's generally our um, catalyst to take action, so. Well, I mean, if we're gonna approve a new master sign program when there are violations existing, uh, that doesn't uh, uh, sit well with me. It would seem like both businesses would have to conform <coughs> to the new sign program. TJ, uh, did you have something for you? Uh, a couple of questions. One, um, you know, these seem to be, uh, I'm, I'm not one that's in favor of micromanaging, especially our staff, but these seemed, especially in the village, seem to be um, very personal um, to other businesses in the community uh, in the area and I, I hate to see the onus put on our community development director to pick the colors and the signs so is there any consideration of maybe making this a planning commission decision versus a community development director not I I, I prefer you guys handling the things you just handle but um, these types of things I, I remember we had a lot of discussion in village come to us is that how it so is? um currently this is the only master sign program i know of in the village all signs typically yeah. come to the planning commission and that was something in the zoning code update that we did make an administrative review for signs but not in the village so um all sign permits do come to the planning commission so this is unique we actually discovered the master sign program when the code violation came in and um the applicant originally signed, uh, brought in an application for a sign permit to come to the Planning Commission, but once we realized there's actually a master sign program here, we said actually, you, you can't just bring in, you, you have to conform with this, and then he says, well, how do I get them to look at this sign, because this is what I'd like them to consider. So we, we then took these steps to amend, to clarify the master sign program. And well, that, that would be one concern is maybe at least in the village, it comes to the Planning Commission. Uh, it, this is a uh, somewhat sensitive discussion in, in the village. And we've denied, well, across the street, we denied the vertical um, sign after they had put quite a bit of money into it. So um, that would be a, a concern I would have, is maybe having this come to the Planning Commission. That would be consistent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'll save my comments. Um, before we get to the public, I had a question about uh, the on 103, the second sign along SoCal Creek. Mm -hmm. um, how does that fit into our ordinance? I mean, it's not a is that considered a corner. It was just approved as part of the original master that was sign part of the original. Yeah. Um, and I and I believe the discussion in the minutes had to do with visibility for people coming across, you know, Stockton Avenue, the bridge there into town. That was their right. rationale for allowing that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, with that, I'll uh, open this item up to the public. If members of the public wish to address the Planning Commission on this item, please step forward. Seeing none, um, I'm going to close the microphone up and uh, I'll bring it back for Commission uh, discussion and action. Could I ask Commissioner Welch a question about? So 
Were you sure. trying to suggest that uh, <coughs> on the sign program that has been proposed by staff that we keep the sign program and change the bottom line or exactly. simply get rid of the sign program and say all signs in the village need to come to the planning committee? You know, I actually, originally I thought just about changing the bottom so it's not administrative, but um, since this is the only master sign plan we have for the village, I, I could go either way. I'm, I'm open to either one of those. I, what, is there a problem with doing that since we already have one master sign program? You know, we haven't discussed it with the property owner at all, but... Mm -hmm. um, well, well, that would mean we would be treating this master sign program differently than we have all our other master sign programs. And is the fact, well, the unique uh, feature is that it's in the village, <coughs> gives us sufficient findings to treat this one differently? So um, I can bring up King's Plaza as an example. Under the King's Plaza Master Sign Program, there was an administrative review of most of the signs, but the larger signs within the King's Plaza are required to come to Planning Commission. So we, we have set a precedence before of, um, you know, the, okay. the, of coming to Planning Commission for certain signs. If you like the setup of it having a balance between the two where they both have those front awnings, maybe keeping the master sign program as appropriate so that people know what to, what to bring to the Planning Commission. But otherwise, if that's not a preference, you could. Um, well, well, maybe just, just to move this along, unless anyone has a real disagreement, maybe we just keep this master sign program, change the, the wording in the bottom that um, it's not administrative, that it comes back for review to the Planning Commission, and then we'll be wise in the future on Good how question. we do um, If we do that, where does that leave the signs that they have today? Because I um, sort of agree with um, Commissioner Westman's comment that these signs, the white background really jumps out at me and says it's not consistent and it doesn't look good. Um, if we approve the master sign program, it has to come to planning commission for approval, then where does that leave them with a sign today? Um, I don't believe the applicant is here, but I would suggest possibly continu continuing Continue. this to the next meeting so that they could bring forth a design that possibly could be approved by the planning commission. Well, I, if I'm totally uncomfortable with what's going on here, okay. quite honestly. We've got, I, I'm not even sure what the application's for, but we've got the staff designing a master sign program for an applicant who's not present, didn't show up at the hearing, and what I remember reading is they were saying that their signs they thought were similar to our meters, and they think they're maybe seeking permission to have their signs there are other issues of uh, non-conforming signs. I think we should continue this and try and restore some order to the application. Kim, yeah, it may, it may be a formal way of, of doing that. It's just um, maybe I need some clarif clarification, but is to send this back to the building owner on exactly what we're looking for as far as some discussion on the sign review and that it needs to come back to the Planning Commission um, with some understanding. In general, I don't think the idea of a master sign program in the central village, right in the, is really, given all the issues we've had about signs, yeah. is really it's a good a, idea. I don't think it's a good idea either. So we should continue it and. But is, is there some way to communicate back to the applicant that the size increase that they're asking for is not being approved? I, I, I think for, for me, uh, I would communicate to the applicant that their signs need to be similar to the two existing signs on Armamita Winery and that um, they don't need to be the exact same color but they need to be something that's you know consistent and fits with the building. And, you know, staff could communicate that with them. I agree. And then continue it for a okay. clarified application. We'll continue it to give everybody an opportunity to chat. 
And, and if we do continue it, uh, what's the status of the current signs? We allowed them to keep them up through this meeting, so I guess we could allow them to keep them up through the next one or not, depending on what you. I, I don't have a problem keeping them up for that's your business. Okay. Okay. As long as have some signage. Right to the next meeting then. So do we have a motion to continue this item? I will so move. I'll second it. There's a motion and uh, some staff uh, took notes that they can be passed on to the applicant. Uh, with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Um, before you tonight, we have the Retail Cannabis Establishment Ordinance. I'll let Chairperson Story, actually, sorry. I Oh, no, I, I was going to let you, you know, you're gonna <laughs> run you run jumped in. Okay, go, sorry, for I just go for it. <laughs> jumped in. Um, so at the last meeting, I provided you with an overview of um, the city council direction towards a possible adoption of retail cannabis sales in the regional commercial zone. And it'll be dependent on the voter approval. Um, so quick overview. In 1996, uh, Prop 215 for medical marijuana passed. In 2014, the city banned all commercial and cultivation processes for cannabis in the city limits. In 2016, Prop 64 passed for medical mar um, for recreational marijuana. And in 2017, the city um, updated our ordinance regarding cannabis to further ban commercial marijuana uses except for within laboratories. And more recently after, we were the, the direction in 2017 was let's see what, what the state comes out with and then rethink this in the future. So more recently, the council has given us direction to move forward with a retail sales um, to be considered in the regional commercial district, but based on a community vote. So um, this will... Um, this amendment will only take place if the community votes for it. So the ordinances will include amendments to Chapter 9.61 to allow a, a retail cannabis license. This evening we're reviewing an amendment to the zoning code to allow it within the regional commercial district. Um, we'll also adopt a new marijuana tax ordinance and that will be the item that goes out for vote and amendments to the fee schedule for new applications that come in to be reviewed. And as I previously stated, the tax considerations will be on the 2018 ballot measure to impose a local tax. This, because it will be on the t um, ballot measure, we're under a tight deadline in getting this completed. So um, all items have to be in by August. So here we are on June 7th, and tonight is our night to consider dr the draft ordinance for allowing cannabis within the regional commercial the City Council will review the first reading on June 28th, followed by a second reading on July 26th. And as you can see, there's one other meeting on August 10th in which they could consider if, if they want additional information or anything that it could be considered at that August 10th. It's the ballot deadline. Um, so the three parts to this are the zoning code, um, which is what we'll be reviewing this evening, and the retail component for a retail cannabis uh, license, which will be under the purview of the police department, which will include best practices, um, background checks, and the, it'll, the owner will be responsible for the permit, and the police will have the ability to revoke the permit or suspend it, and the tax initiative, so with a not to exceed amount of 10%, and the council will have the ability to adjust that, um, that tax based on the market. So here you can see the, um, where the regional commercial zone is. It extends north from Capitola Road. It includes Clare Street, 41st Avenue, and Auto Plaza Drive. I also included a regional map that shows the existing cannabis retail sales um, that are included within the city of 
um, Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz, and the blue square is our small little section of the regional commercial zone within Capitola. Um, so now we'll jump into the zoning code changes. So within the land use table of the regional commercial, a new land use type for retail cannibal, cannabis establishments will be listed. It re will require a conditional use permit with specific standards that will be outlined. Now we'll jump into those standards. Um, under the conditional use permit requirements, a cannabis retail license will be required, and that's a selective process that goes through the chief of police. Um, Next, the, within the zoning regulations, is the, there's a required distance from schools and churches. Under the state regulations, there's a minimum 600 feet buffer required. Under our draft ordinance, we increase that to 1,000 feet of uh, a 1,000 foot path of travel between schools, churches, and the use. Also, we implemented a 500 foot buffer between other cannabis retailers. Um, we're going to require independent access and specific sign standards. Um, in looking at sign standards, there's, I included three options. We actually, I went out with the chief of police and we did, we went around the county and looked at all, a couple of the newer establishments that have come in. And in talking with them, they didn't seem bothered by the regulations within the county. They're, they're really strict. I think it's up to 12 square feet. Um, you're allowed to have one um, green cross, and it's very limiting, but it didn't seem to be a problem when talking to some of the business owners. So, um, so within the first option, it would have to comply under our regular sign regulations, so business name and logo would be fine. Um, a maximum of 50 square feet is allowed in the regional commercial zone. Multiple signs would be allowed as long as it's under the 50 square feet and it complies with the sign standards and it would be an administrative approval. And the pictures you're showing there are examples of? They're just examples of what could be. What could be, yeah, not what you but found. The, um, yeah, there really isn't much really large signage to show you from other neighboring jurisdictions. So what could be? So under our code, you could have a wall sign as well as a mon. Well, I guess you could have mm -hmm. either a wall sign or a monument sign. Um, but a wall sign could be up to 50 square feet if you if it has 50 linear feet of business. So. But on ours, we're saying that they couldn't have like the marijuana leaf there. They couldn't say cannabis on it. So under the Option one, they could. So any um, any language or sorry, any um, language or images could reference cannabis under option one. It just option one is that they just need to comply with the city sign code. And any of these options can be amended. If that one up there that says Star Buds. Yeah. Is that in Santa Cruz County? No, I just oh, okay. found this on the internet. Oh. So, yeah. um, option two is this is a actually um, located at the end of 41st on SoCal and it's called Treehouse. So within option two, you could have the business name. Um, there'd be no reference to cannabis through language, so this would comply, the Treehouse. Um, you could have one logo or a green cross and it wouldn't be limited to um, the logo or green cross that could reference cannabis. A maximum of 20 square feet, and it would require planning commission approval. Under option three, you could have the business name, um, 15 square feet max. So this is a little bit larger than what the county allows right now at 12 square feet. Illumination during operating hours. That's a standard I believe the county has. Planning commission approval would be required, and this also states no reference to cannabis through symbols or language. So I've summarized all three of these into a table, and um, the next slide is just asking for um, you to select the sign standards that you would prefer and that staff recommends approval of, or a positive recommendation for cannabis retail establishments. 
So I have one, one question. Mm -hmm. um, there's no reference in the beginning to a distance from residents. And I know that most of our central commercial zone does not, isn't adjacent to any residential uses. But I seem to recall over on Auto Plaza that we are pretty close. So I'm just wondering if we shouldn't mention in the, in the code that it has to be a certain distance from residential use, as well as churches and schools. So I'm gonna pull up a map. There's around Clare Street, so if, if um, so the Browns Ranch is close, that's also in the regional commercial, so that would require addition, you know, I don't think Browns Ranch should be able to have a retail establishment if we had a buffer and also on the um, east side of 41st Avenue, all of the properties where McDonald's is and Whole Foods, they also back up to residential. So by if we were to include residential, it would um, really further limit where cannabis retail sales could be. So um, since we're, we're talking about the sign portion of it, um, For me, you know, I, I would like to make certain that we include something that, you know, signage is other things that they put on the building as well. Like if somebody decides to paint a big mural on the side of their building uh, to advertise that it's a, you know, cannabis establishment or something like that. So I don't know exactly how to come up with that wording, but I would like to, you know, have something that they can't put other things on the building, um, like murals or um, artwork. Um. So maybe I can short circuit this. I, I mean, I'll see what, how the other commissioners feel. I, I'm not getting yet why we should treat this differently from any other sign as a design issue uh, because of the product. I mean, I would just apply whatever design sign design rules we have to this just like any other business so do no. we want to mm -hmm. hear from the public first because oh, i think okay. they may have some concerns okay. about that i we mm -hmm. probably should open the public hearing before we go too much further are there, are there yeah. any other questions from commissioners uh, i'll Stanford? wait till after we get public yeah, input i have um <coughs> Was that the conclusion of that? That is the conclusion. So staff, staff would like direction on signs and the ordinance overall, and then we suggest a positive recommendation to city council. Yeah. Uh, but I, I did have a question, Katie, about um, these options. They um, seems to be a distinction between the signage and the business or and the logo. Um, is the logo is that included in the maximum size in option two and option three? Yes. It is okay so if they have a cross uh, it's going to be either limited to the 20 square feet or the 15 square feet mm -hmm. and you can further if you'd like to limit the size of the logo we could take that a step further as well okay thank you uh, with that I'll um, open this item up to the public if there's members of the public that would like to address the Commission um, on the proposed uh, our cannabis ordinance please step up Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Jenna Shankman. I am a member of Community Prevention Partners, which is a county-wide multi-sector um, substance use disorder prevention coalition. Uh, one of my colleagues was here uh, last time. Um, and um, we, on this issue, are thinking about um, norms and just um, impact on, on youth. And um, that is why, as it mentions in the report, um, other jurisdictions have looked at um, treating some of the signs differently. And upon uh, looking at the different options, it seems that um, number three um, is most in alignment in terms of limiting to the only the one exterior sign, um, not having any reference through symbols or language to cannabis, um, which we found to be really important um, in terms of um, 
uh, decreasing youth use and that signs shall not be directly illuminated except during operating hours and to keep it at the 15 square feet, which is the same as Watsonville, but larger than unincorporated county. Um, however, um, I do know that in other jurisdictions, they also do allow, as you saw in the images, um, a logo as long as it is within certain size constraints. So that seems um, reasonable as long as the, the logo doesn't have that, then that reference to um, a cannabis image. Um, so just thinking about these uh, sign restrictions to help limit kind of the proliferation and prominence that um, of these, these images, um, which um, just like other types of advertising can increase the, the age, uh, decrease the age the young person uh, starts to use cannabis or their perception of harm in just terms of normalizing it. So uh, we do feel that having um, some of these restrictions can just help um, you know, set the, the, that tone. So thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Please step up. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Gina Cole. I work for a nonprofit agency in Watsonville, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. We are members of the uh, Community Prevention Partners um, as well, uh, and we work, we've work. we worked very closely with um, CPP, Community Prevention Partners, on a number of different issues. We work on with tobacco. Um, we're very familiar with tobacco retail licensing. Um, we work with them with alcohol issues and as cannabis has emerged and the adult use um, has passed and become uh, a part of who we are as Californians now, we've, we've done a lot of work around that. We work very closely with industry folk. Um, the two um, signs that you showed, Treehouse and Kind Peoples, are both folks that we've worked with for the last, how long, Jenna, like four months, four, three years, two years? Yeah, um, so industry folk here are um, very much in tune with the, I, I guess with public health needs and with public health concerns, especially around youth, youth access, and youth um, influence. Um, we do a prevention program and part of our, uh, part of our work as at uh, PVPSA is prevention work in the schools um, in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, and we hear all the time, especially at the turn at the in January, the kids were like, "Dude, it's illegal now," and we're like, "Dude, 21." So there is there are a lot of myths and misconceptions, especially with youth, that they could walk right into a uh, a, f a a dispensary, they could walk right into a shop and get what they need, they do not realizing that they must be 21. Um, youth are very, very influenced by what they see. And I, I wanna just point out, and I'm s I was meant to run by the office, I've got this collection of Good Times um, uh, newspapers from about the last, I don't know, about six months. And it's interesting to see, we actually wrote a letter, some of the early advertising in January um, some of the uh, providers were actually showing marijuana leaves in their half, their full page ad in the Good Times. And we actually wrote a letter to the Good Times that wasn't published, but we noticed that after that letter, you know, stating this is a little bit over the top, most of their advertising has been toned down. They will have gone to the Green Cross. One of them has gone to, instead of a marijuana leaf, it's a, um, a fi, it's, it's, surfboards, it's green surfboards. It looks still kind of like a marijuana leaf, but it's, it's not, so it's not as blatant because we do know that youth are influenced by, by that kind of advertising. And so that's kind of our concern. We do recommend that you go with the sign three option um, to really not necessarily, people know, people already know what it is, they know what it's there for, and I, it's, again, youth influence and um, <coughs> social norming. We need to really be concerned about that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Andrea Solano. I'm the project director for the tobacco education program at the health department. I'm here with a couple of colleagues in tobacco prevention. We work very closely with community prevention partners to ensure consistency on um, some of the, the policy work that we're doing. Um, 
and related to alcohol, like Tina mentioned, tobacco, and now cannabis. So you may or may not be aware of this, but recently we've seen an explosion in popularity among flavored tobacco products, um, particularly in electronic flavored products like e-cigs, vapes, and Juul. And these all come in a variety of fruit and candy flavored flavors. They come in colorful and child-friendly packages. Um, recent studies sh tell us that these are very popular among young people. In fact, over 80% of, of young people who ever use tobacco started with a flavored product. So public health officials and um, policymakers across the state are working really hard to, re to reduce youth exposure to these products through sales and advertising restrictions. Just this past Tuesday in San Francisco, you may be aware they, they, they passed a complete ban on the sale of flavored products. It's the strictest ban in the nation. So, and the reason for that is because research tells us that advertising signage, the, the exposure that we have in marketing has an impact on our, on our choices, our consumer choices. And exposure to tobacco marketing in stores is proven to increase tobacco experimentation among youths, youth and their use, overall youth, use. <laughs> And it's more, in fact, it's more powerful than peer pressure and even family smoking rates. So I just wanted to share some of that information, what we know in tobacco and how we've shaped some of the tobacco policies and what's, what's been effective in decreasing youth rates with traditional cigarette products and now what we're doing with the new uh, electronic products. And so we thank you for carefully considering the development of this policy and um, taking in consideration uh, how this may impact youth use Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the commission on this item? Seeing none, I'm going to close the microphone and I'll bring the matter uh, back to the commission for discussion and action. Um, I, I, my opinion a little may bit. Right. <coughs> Maybe I'll jump in. I'll oh, jump in here first. Um, first, thank you very much for coming and sharing uh, your. Um, knowledge and insight from the areas you work and I, I think it's something we have to consider uh, I mean I, I was born in Santa Cruz I was raised in Mayberry RFD, RFD but I, I'm not that naive really um, but I'm not a big proponent of this whole this whole concept I understand that I'm not a city council member either and it's their choice but I think when we look at what we what we are here to discuss uh, this area of zoning I don't see how it even fits in there. I, if you look at, we're going to discuss the Capitola Mall tonight. We've had long plans with our general plan about the Capitola Mall area, this uh, commercial, uh, regional commercial area, about having housing around it. I talked with uh, residents who live behind the Trader Joe's area, not happy about this, didn't know about it, not happy about um, these products being sold in their neighborhood. They already have a huge impact of people as a thoroughfare going um, from that west side into the mall area, homeless, other people walking through, foot traffic, they think that will be a large impact. If you look on the uh, east side of 41st Avenue, you have the mobile home park and other homes back there behind the auto retail. I, personally, I don't see how it fits in, but I, I've done a little bit of, uh, of research on this. One, we have, uh, for those who prefer to, uh, to use this, uh, material uh, Katie put up a screen with a number of areas already where it's available for people to purchase uh, we're 1.7 square miles I don't know that if we need to put one two three or four in in the city of Capitola myself but if you look at what's happening we, we're fortunate because we have some people that stepped out before us uh, Colorado and Washington and uh, and they're already seeing some some large concerns. Colorado Springs, 23% homeless increase since they uh, put this, uh, their uh, marijuana uh, in, um, recreational marijuana available. Um, one thing that the um, sheriff has noticed in both Washington and Colorado is they can't keep up with the black market supply of this. And so with the tax that the cities are putting on it, um, it actually has forced uh, or made uh, the black market even um, a larger area of concern because um, they don't have to pay the taxes and stuff. So uh, I talked with our police chief. Um, he shared the concerns of what's happening in Colorado and Washington. 
Um, biggest concern for our chief and, and for me, and I think for these ladies coming here tonight, is our youth. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I spent my career in public safety. Um, and by the way, the Green Cross has been hijacked because that was a National Safety Council that I grew up with. So uh, they hijacked the Green Cross. But I had three uh, medical marijuana um, dispensaries in my district. I'd been to stabbing, shootings, not on, uh, you know, uh, basis maybe a couple times a year on a routine basis had the family of one of the dispensaries uh, kidnapped and held ransom I just for me I don't think the zoning uh, should be in in Capitol and uh, I'm not in favor of it but I know I'm the minority probably so if it comes down to it I think for me uh, the only thing I could live with is option three all right thank you TJ so I have a question for the so it's my understanding that um, if we don't adopt some kind of ordinance like this, then um, there's really uh, no prohibition to someone coming and opening up a you know retail marijuana store in the regional commercial shopping center. Anyway, there right now it is prohibited. So but that's because of a moratorium that we have. No, in our um, chapter 9.61, retail sales are prohibited in Capitola. So this, the steps we're taking here would be to allow retail sales within chapter 9.61 and amend the zoning code, none of which would take effect unless it was voted in by the Capitola voters. So. So right now it is prohibited. It's going to be the voters that will have a chance to give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. Mm -hmm. yep, don't worry. So when this goes to city council, it will be, it, it will come with the retail sales ordinance, which um, has all the standards for how many would be allowed within the regional commercial. Um, what the, for the retail, so for the license that will be approved by the chief of police, that's a separate, that's an amendment to chapter 9.61. Under the zoning purview is, is just the regional commercial. So tonight we would talk about where they could be located within the regional commercial and appropriate signs. But when it gets to city council, they'll be looking at the license and what is required for a retail um, sales, a retail cannabis license. And that will have all the more strict regulations of um, making sure that all best practices are followed, that there's background checks, that the correct safety measures and cameras are in place within an establishment. Um, I just so. have one more question. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about, you know, in the information that you gave us, uh, limiting them to uh, 500 feet from each other. Mm -hmm. Do we have any estimate or idea about how many could go into the regional commercial district if we use that standard? So the area of um, 41st Avenue from Capitola Road to Route 1 or to the city boundary is I think a little bit over 2,000 linear feet. So in, in that instance, if you were to put one at Bank of America and one every 500 feet, you could possibly get four in along 41st Avenue. But that's not including, like Brown's Ranch could possibly have one. Um, the building at Auto Plaza Drive where you come in the old Kia building. So there's, and across the street. So I, I would say you could at least get probably seven or eight along the corridor. And I could map it to, to get a better estimate. But, but, one of but the, I, the council had talked about one to three in their initial awesome. discussions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any uh, other questions or comments on this item? Linda, you want um, to weigh in? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weigh in on this one because I have sort of looked at both sides of it. Um, the thing that makes it difficult for me is the, the recreational part of it because I think that being able to have access to medical cannabis has become more and more of an, um, of an acceptable thing. And I, I think that that's a good thing. Um, 
I too had a lot of several residents that um, indicated concern over having retail sales of marijuana close to their house um, for the reasons of um, I don't know if there are regulations like there are with cigarettes you can't be within a certain you know distance of a of a business and be smoking cigarettes now that it's legal for adults to smoke marijuana that was a concern that I heard from them so if the ballot measure gets approved by the majority of the people in the area um, then in my mind it it's a product like other products and I think that people have a right to have um, the name of their business on their sign and that it get treated the same way but at the same time we've learned from cigarettes that the the, the camel man attracts kids and so having the right to design a logo could wind up putting our youth in, in harm's way the same way cigarettes did and look how long it's taken us to get a handle on that one. So I understand um, Commissioner Newman's position that we shouldn't treat this any differently but at the same time I'm much more mm -hmm. leaning towards option three and limiting it or option two with a green cross and not a logo and no additional artwork on the building the sign because um, you do you, you go to Santa Cruz and you see t-shirt print shops that have these great big murals that have been painted um, that give them uh, a different kind of presence um, that could be very attractive to our youth and so I don't want to get into designing people's logos the only way it seems to me to prevent that from happening would be to limit it to a green cross and the name of the business which isn't exactly one of your choices up there so those are my comments thank well, you I'll go, I'll go one, one more round just uh, okay. briefly um, it's all very interesting discussion but I'm not seeing a lot of traditional planning commission issues here um, I think there are issues for the City Council issues for the voters uh, p general policy society policy issues but from a planning standpoint I'm having trouble seeing uh, where we really fit in here um, so I'm I'm inclined to apply rule the same rules as we apply to any other business in terms of design and signage and facade and etc which are the things that we traditionally deal with Mm -hmm. um, I think that the whole signage question is a typical, you know, sort of planning role that um, uh, we have. And uh, for me, I would go along with option three with the idea that there would be no additional artwork allowed on the building. Um, yeah. And then, um, as uh, our community development director said, it's the council who's going to deal with the other issues and, and, and the police department. So, um, let's. Well, I just wanted to tell you that uh, I support option three as well. Um, so, I would make a motion that, cause w that we go along with option three with no additional artwork. And, but could, uh, could I ask a question about? Um, uh, we had talked about this being in proximity of residences. Um, uh, you know, part of the standards was that it wouldn't uh, uh, require a thousand foot uh, buffer between the um, uh, dispensary and um, any uh, schools or churches. Could that include any residents? Um, so, a thousand feet from any residents would r extremely limit where these could take place. I, I was gonna bring up that we do have a standard for drive-throughs now that is a 100 foot buffer from a, any residents. So it would make it that, you know, Brown's, r Brown Ranch right. could not have them. Um, the buildings such as, that are set back on the east side of 41st could not 
have them, but it would, I think a thousand foot buffer may be too broad. Too broad, okay. Mm -hmm. But if, um, well, I would encourage the city council to look at maybe some buffer okay. um, as it relates to residents as well. Um, and I, I agree, you know, this is a bigger, the bigger issue is for the city council to handle, uh, but I think it is one of our purview to give guidance and our opportunity to talk about the signage. <coughs> um, and just in short, I think it's important. I mean, this is a huge social change, and I think it's important to tread lightly. Uh, I mean, this is still a federal Schedule I substance, um, and I think those are the reasons why we want to be cautious and maybe protective of, you know, of, you know, not only children, but other people in the society who maybe need some time to adjust to this, and let's see what the impacts are. And if we're gonna do that, let's, let's I mean, let's do it with some discretion. Um, and I think that that's the reason why I see Ed uh, uh, about um, having different standards for this product as opposed to any other products. And who knows, over time, maybe all the issues will be worked out uh, and we can be more free about it. But um, yes. Before we go forward with the motion, can I ask the uh, motion maker one just um, sure. possible for a friendly amendment? Um, the green cross is a standardized symbol that's going to be coming more and more. Um, Capitola is an international destination. So one of the things that I've learned in my travels is when you're looking for someplace, having that uh, simple symbol may help people identify locations. So I, I'm just asking if option three with the addition of a green cross would meet with your. That would be fine with me. And I could second the motion that you made with that okay. and friendly amendment. And does the motion include having um, the buffer at least 100 feet? A uh, hundred foot buffer for residents. Um, so I'd like clarity if you'd like to encourage that. If you'd like me to bring the message that you'd like it encouraged, or would you like a one hundred foot we, buffer? I, I thought that we wanted to uh, send the message to the council that we thought they should. Right. Yes. Encourage. Yeah. Oh. Having a hundred foot buffer for residents. Okay. So option three plus the green cross. I could second that motion. Okay. You know the discussion on the motion? There's a motion and a second. Um, so why don't we um, um, have a roll call vote? Commissioner Newman? No. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Welch? No. Commissioner Westman? Yes. Chairperson Story? Aye. The motion passes three to two. Next, that will bring us to item 5D. And this is a, a design permit application to remodel uh, the Sears building uh, at the Capitola Mall and to convert the space into three separate tenant spaces um, with updated exterior facades. Um, the retail's proposed are Sears, TJ Maxx, uh, slash Home Goods. Um, and um, Petco. So we'll begin with a staff report, please. Thank you, Chairman Story and Commissioners. So as just stated, the application before you this evening is for a master sign program and a design permit um, for the Sears property at 4015 Capitola Road. It also includes uh, a phase two with development pads, one along 41st Avenue and one along Capitola Road. Um, in this image, you can see how the tenants will be divided within the proposal. So the Sears building will be divided to <coughs> include a TJ Maxx and a Petco. Um, and here you can see the two 4,000 square foot pads that are proposed. These are um, the phased approach to the pads they um, they have not submitted design permits or um, actual land uses tied to these pads but they're conceptual and in discussions with the applicant they would be willing to put some conditions 
upon having to stub out the pads and have applications in process in order to do the um, the final um, occupancy of the new tenant spaces. None of that has been completely worked out, so I don't really feel comfortable tying any conditions to it at this point. But in one meeting with them, there was discussions of, of yes, they would be amenable to um, within the phased approach having conditions tied to getting into that second phase before um, occupancy of the first phase. So a timeline was in the um, staff report. I'm not going to go through every step of the timeline for you, but the important items are back in December of 2016, the Planning Commission did do a conceptual review of this application um, in which you gave them a lot of feedback of how you would like to see the the plan revised for the future. One of the major changes that did come in is the original conceptual review did not include improving the Sears site, the Sears building itself, and now they've put together um, facade finishes on the exterior of, of Sears. They've also updated the plans to include a couple bike lanes and um, the phase two um, paths are there and also improvements along the facades. Um, We've gone through two series of incomplete letters and we've had a few meetings. Um, back in February of, 28th of, February 28th of this year, I sent out my second incomplete letter. There were some emails in between the time that the application was resubmitted explaining that we're in the process of, adopt, of adopting the new code that would pertain to this project. Um, and that I would need more time. Unfortunately, in that letter, I did not deem it incomplete. So on May 9th of this year, very recently, the applicant's attorney um, sent in a letter <coughs> stating that they'd like the application deemed complete under the Permit Streamlining Act. So in review of that, um, the applicant is correct that an incomplete letter was not sent out within the 30 days. So therefore, we um, accommodated and worked hard to get them on the agenda this evening. In the meantime, um, another important factor <coughs> is that the environmental site assessment was provided to staff last December. Um, I sent that out for a second party review in which it came back stating that the, the work that was done was not for a full facility closure of the site. It was to remove one, joy, uh, one of the joists at the time. and that permit no longer applied and to move forward with a full facility closure, you have to go back to the county and have um, and pull the proper permits for a facility closure. So I informed them of the, um, that they still needed to uh, um, complete the ESA. So we're here tonight reviewing their application and um, due to the Permit Streamlining Act, and there, there still is not compliance with the environmental review of this from the county, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So I'm gonna give you an overview of what they are proposing. Um, tenant B would be Petco, uh, 11,000 square feet. Here's the exterior of the proposed Petco. You can see that elements of the existing mall are kept within this proposal, so the brick veneer on the corner stays and some of the stucco as it extends towards the um, TJ Maxx. New elements are the entryway for the, the large entryway for the arrival at Petco. Also, um, new brick veneer along the base, and they've added some benches and also a plant trellis, I believe. It looks like a living wall. The details of that were not specifically called out in the plans, but as you can see, the greenery on the wall, I believe, is a trellis structure. Um, this is a two-dimensional or three-dimensional uh, image of the Petco, so you can see how the new entryway um, projects off the building um, and the signage extends above the existing um, top of wall. The next is the TJ Maxx Home Goods. This is much larger in size at 40,000 square feet. Um, again, uh, a large sense of arrival with the new entryway. Um, they're utilizing wood siding as finishes and stucco on the main entryway. Again, 
elements of the existing building will stay. The existing <coughs> stucco will be repainted. They're carrying the brick veneer, the new brick veneer uh, accent across the building on this facade. And again, the plant trellis idea, some new benches. Um, they're going to tear out the existing planters and build new planters. Um, and then to the right of this will be the new Sears. So, and here's a 3D image of TJ Maxx Home Goods. So again, this is this entryway is is about double the size of the Petco entryway. So Sears um, will remain on the east side of the building. And as you can see, one thing I meant to point out before is that the new tenants, tenants A and B, will not be connected to the mall. There'll be no entryway to go from those new new establishments to connect into the mall. Here you can see the mall connection and how you could get through the Sears. Uh, to the mall. Um, the Sears update, um, the new facades are, it's more of a contemporary look and a nice improvement here with stucco being repainted but introducing repetitive elements such as the brick veneer, the wood siding, metal louver, louvers, and um, just different accents that are repeated and make a nice contemporary finish to the whole exterior. Again, um, the existing planters will be ripped out and replaced in certain areas and benches are incorporated in some of the planters. And this is the facade facing 41st Avenue. Um, within the application there was a master sign program. Um, the master sign program under, under our new code, signs are limited to 50 square feet plus a 25% allowance by the Planning Commission. Of course, within a master sign program, you are allowed to go beyond those standards, so that's what this application is for, is to be able to go beyond those standards. Um, the proposed master sign program for Sears includes a 180 square foot east sign on the east side and 251 square feet on the south. TJ Maxx's sign is 200 square feet and the Petco is at 75 square feet. So those exceptions would be requested within their master sign program. If the Planning Commission were to approve the signs under the master sign program, I would request that, um, I would suggest that similar to the previous application we looked at tonight, that it not be an administrative review if a new sign were to come in at this size. They should definitely always have the Planning Commission review and that's consistent with what occurred at Kings Plaza is that the larger signs for the big box tenants would be re reviewed by the Planning Commission. So first, we'll look at sustainability. Within a design permit, under the, this application is reviewed under the new code. <coughs> and within a design permit, there's different criteria A through S. I'm only bringing up those criteria that we have found the application not to be in compliance with rather than go through every item, uh, every criteria. So within sustainability, as I mentioned, <coughs> the applicant um, had previously pulled permits to remove a joist within the Sears location. That was under a 2014 and 2016 environmental site an analysis. Um, the county acts as a contractor to the city. Within our municipal code, they are given the responsibilities of, of doing our environmental review um, for this type of work for a facility closure. The county did not receive a full a permit for a facility closure at Sears. When I spoke with the county, um, their understanding was that the new tenant may or may not be an automotive use in the future. So therefore, the permit that they issued to remove the one joist was, um, or hoist, sorry, was specifically under the assumption that this, this site could be utilized as an automotive site in the future. So um, once I had the third party review done and then in talking with the county again, they said they would have to come back in for a th full facility closure permit, knowing that they want this site to change to retail use. As of yesterday, it's my understanding that the county had not heard from the applicant. So at this point, um, it's my understanding, unless they met with them today, that 
no action had been taken on uh, cleaning up the current outstanding issue with a facility closure permit. And in order for us, when, when giving out the, um, when going through the steps, prior to going through CEQA, we need the ESAs to be complete, the environmental site assessments, to understand what type of impacts are on the site and whether or not um, we could do a negative deck for this project, a mitigated negative deck, or an exception. So that part, the CEQA review has been on hold until the full ESA site assessments are completed. So without that, I was not able to move forward with CEQA review. Um, drainage is another um, item that is not yet, in, that is not in compliance with under the current proposal. So within the municipal code section 3.16, the city is required Excuse me for one moment. The city is required to make sure that all, s all projects for development are in compliance with stormwater regulations of the state. So um, in doing the review, we, this was stormwater was sent out to a third party and with the information provided, the third party is not, was not able to make findings that stormwater is in compliance with the local um, Municipal Code Section 13.16, which ties back to the state regulations. So those two um, items are technical requirements. So within planning review, there are qu quantitative technical requirements and qualitative. Just want to highlight to you for staff at this point with these two um, quantitative technical requirements, we could not write up findings in support of approval of this project due to outstanding environmental issues. So moving forward, we'll go into more of the qualitative. Um, so under design permit criteria for, um, one is for pedestrian environment and that the primary entrances should be oriented towards and visible to the street and supportive of an active realm and an inviting pedestrian environment. Um, this standard, when looking at a mall, there's the pedestrian environment also, it, a mall isn't, each property within a mall isn't just a property that stands alone and has no connection to the neighboring buildings. One of the main functions of a mall is that you can move from a tenant space into the mall and it has a um, relationship in which pedestrians can move through to the other properties. Within this application, the two new tenant space lack any internal connectivity to the seers and to the further to the mall. Um, under the design permit criteria, there's four applicable standards, one for architectural style, one for ar articulation and visual interest, materials, and <coughs> signs. Um, since the application has come back in, the articulation and visual interest, they've done a lot of work there in terms of making the buildings more interesting, adding those living walls. Um, the materials on the um, Sears building are well coordinated. <coughs> uh, the signs within the Sears building kind of fit in with the Sears building, but as I stated prior, um, the Petco and TJ Maxx signs, it seems like the design is more about the signs than the architecture, but the Sears building was r um, finished with a contemporary style. Um, there's great articulation and visual interest as you move around the building. Um, and re repeating the materials and really creating a sense of a, a, an architectural style overall. When we look at the TJ Maxx and the Petco, um, the architectural style to get into that is it should be compatible with the surrounding and built natural environment. Um, it, it is an authentic implementation of appropriate established architectural styles and reflective of Capitola's coastal village character. I think this is the one standard that this really lacks. Um, the architectural style is really undefined. It's more of um, new, you know, really pronounced entryways to these two structures, but the you could not define what the architectural style is to this. Um, I don't, or I'm able, unable to other than it creates a great background for very large <coughs> signs. Um, they've 
kept the same, you know, the old mall facades of the brick. Uh, they're going to repaint the stucco, but really it doesn't create a true architectural style. I think Sears kind of did take, should get, um, did define a new architectural style. So moving out of design, we'll now talk about parking and access. So the parking areas should be located and designed to minimize visual impacts and maintain Capitola's distinctive neighborhoods and pedestrian-friendly environment. Safe and convenient connections are provided for pedestrians and bicyclists. So within uh, one um, connection that currently is, is not well done, and, and we talked about this, I think, at the conceptual review process, but there's a lack of connectivity that is safe for pedestrians between the Sears and the Target. So during that conceptual meeting, it was suggested to improve that connection. That was not included in this application. Um, what was included were two new bicycle um, lanes, one off of 40th Avenue and one on 38th Avenue to bring bicycles safely to the Capitola Mall. In the review of this application by the Public Works Director and looking at our bike paths and um, some of the RTC language for the future build out of the mall, the um, Public Works Director would like to see bicycle paths on both sides of each of the major um, entrances to the mall as well as a path that's connected going around the mall as that would be consistent with the general plan and um, in, in Capitola's goals for the future. So. Open space in public places um, within non-residential development to provide semi-public outdoor spaces such as plazas and courtyards which help support pedestrian activity within an, engage, an active and engaging public realm. Um, and then we also have land use policy tied to the general plan, just talking about creating great place and um, through your open spaces and public places. So what the applicant has done here, um, this is the facade along Petco. On the top, you can see the image of the facade and below it is actually the improvements along the sidewalk. So the light green area is the areas of new planters. Um, you can see there are three new benches proposed along this facade and an image of the wooden benches are on the bottom right and the new, uh, the Sidewalks will be improved with colored concrete and pavers. This is um, as you move closer to Sears to the east. So again, colored concrete and pavers are proposed, pavers in the entryways. Um, new planters, the existing planter where the corner tucks in is going to be replaced with a new planter. And this is the front of the Sears building facing 41st Avenue. So again, new planters, pavers, and colored concrete along the sidewalk. Um, so with that, I've gone through the, the design elements of this and the design standards. We've um, talked about the technical um, standards of this permit. Also during the review back um, with the conceptual review and I included it in the staff report, there are many um, references to the Capitola Mall within the general plan and really it focuses on making a place that an experience for people in the future through placemaking and the public realm. So in, in, in approving a design permit, there's a requirement that you make findings that um, a design permit is in line with all the criteria of the design permit as well as the municipal code, which um, we've got technical violations with our envir with environmental health and with stormwater um, and making findings that it's also in compliance with the general plan. So staff is recommending that the Planning Commission deny the design permit application and the master sign program based on the fact that we cannot make findings for the design permit criteria it's, and the technicality is that it's not in compliance with the environmental health um, chapter 2.20 and it is also not in compliance with our stormwater regulations contained in chapter 13 16. So thank you and with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Katie. Are there questions from commissioners on the staff report? I have one quick question. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I went back and I looked at the, the concept review that we did and one of the 
uh, points that you brought up then was the width of the sidewalk and how it was it was a nice wide pathway. Um, I didn't see a lot of detail on the planters and how big they are, but were you able to get a kind of an assessment that the the sidewalk is wide enough in those places to accommodate the planters that they're suggesting and still be a wide pedestrian friendly sidewalk? You know, you know, I did notice that some of the planners um, do tend to come out quite a ways in areas, and I, I don't know the exact measurements in, the, in those areas and what the width is, so maybe we could ask the applicant this evening for what those measurements are. I was just noticing that in, in your presentation that some of the benches are turned, which makes mm -hmm. me think they come out farther than I had previously looked. Thank you. I had a question. Yeah. Yes, sir. So on the master sign program, this is a, a master sign program just for this property? Correct. And is there a master sign program for the rest of the mall? There is for the directional um, signs through the mall. There is a so program for that. As I recall, a few years ago, we approved monument signs for the mall. And I think it might have included Sears on the monument signs. Correct. So this is going to impact, if we approved this and the city council approved that it, it would impact that uh, decision in some way, I think. So th for the mall, I, I think it is just the, the monument signs along the mall. So I think that would still be in place, but as a separate master permit for multiple mall tenants. I brought that up at the time. Whose master permit is that? Uh, it's all the properties, including this one, which doesn't. So I'm not sure where that leaves us. But this is just for um, the wall signs for this building. Please, Correct. Yeah. And we don't know if it's the same or different from the requirements for the other buildings in the mall. Yes, I don't know if it's um, the same. There, there no, there's not one master sign program for the exterior buildings. Like Target has had their own permits issued, I know, when uh, one of the rest, two of the restaurants that recently came in had their own signs approved. So there is not an overriding master Did sign program. Did uh, we analyze how this proposed master sign program relates to <coughs> the signs that other properties in the mall have had approved? You know, it's similar in size. <coughs> I, I did. Um, I looked at the recent master sign program that was approved at King's Plaza, and I believe one of those signs goes up to 170 square feet that was approved um, for the grocery store. So it, there are quite a few larger signs. I want to say the Orchard Supply went up to 120 square feet, but I did not include that analysis in the report. I'd be happy to do so in the future. Thank you. And I think Ultra, wasn't Ultra one that we, we passed? It had its sign as larger than when Ultra came in as an independent thing. I think that was mm -hmm. one that was larger. <coughs> uh, any other questions from commissioners? Um, Katie, I had a question about at least the techno de uh, deficiencies. Um, could those be handled through a conditional um, approval of the project? Um, at this point, stormwater, I believe, could, mm -hmm. because stormwater, but they wouldn't be able to move forward with a building permit without stormwater. Right. The unknown environmental impacts tied to um, the, the facility closure, really, I, I wouldn't feel confident about attaching any CEQA-related findings that there's no environmental impacts tied to this property. Mm -hmm. um, through a condition without having no, having the full site analysis and um, knowing that they've sure. come into compliance with a facility closure. Right. So. Thank you. Um, with that, I'll open it up to um, the applicant and, of course, anyone else in the audience that would like to speak to the commission on this item. Yes. Thank you, and uh, good evening, <coughs> commissioners. I want to first thank um, uh, the planning staff, Katie. I uh, also want to th thank the city attorney for moving this matter forward. As you know, we've been at this for some time. We originally started this in April of 2016, and we've been working in earnest for the last two years. 
uh, to try to refine the application, to try to answer staff questions. Uh, obviously, based on the staff recommendation, uh, it's at least staff's view that we're still not there. Uh, we do think we've made a lot of progress uh, on this on this project. I think the one item that I'd like to open with, um, and by the way, I'll mention that the full team is here tonight. Uh, we're here to answer your questions. We're here to uh, be helpful and informative to try to refine this and make sure that everybody's comfortable as we move forward. Um, just, uh, please. Sorry to interrupt, but could you just state your name for the record? Yes. Uh, my apologies. Yes, my name is David Waite, and I am Land Use Counsel for the applicant. All right, thank uh, you, David. For Sarah Teach. Thank you. Um, I think the one item that um, is a little bit of the elephant in the room, so to speak, uh, because it sort of has come up at every meeting we've had on this project, which is the relationship to this project to a larger mall redevelopment plan. The city has a lot invested in a long-term plan, a long-term vision for the redevelopment of the Capitola Mall. And suffice it to say that the city's own plans, uh, its general plan, its uh, vision plan for the Capitola Mall, all recognize very specifically the incremental nature of how these projects have to proceed. And uh, at least by one indication, this is a fairly straightforward <coughs> application. We're demising the Sears property into three tenant spaces and we're putting new signage up for, for the new tenants. Uh, and, that's, and that signage, as you know, for a lot of retailers is, is somewhat formulaic. There's not a lot of flexibility, so we're, we're kind of trying to work with that format for these tenants. But the point is that it's a fairly straightforward application from the standpoint of what we're doing. We're not, we're not changing the footprint. We're not building new buildings. Uh, we're not adding, uh, you know, major amounts of new infrastructure. These are demising the existing space so that we can put these properties into productive use it will generate rent, it will generate sales tax revenue for the city. Uh, all of that is a good thing for everybody. So fairly straightforward application. But again, I think the, the, the elephant in the room is, you know, how does this relate to the long-term vision, the long-term plan with respect to the development of the Capitola Mall or the redevelopment of the Capitola Mall? <laughs> and the answer is that when you sort of hoist that on the petard of, of, of Seritage to say, how does this plan relate to and how will it be consistent over time with a long-term redevelopment plan? The answer is we don't know because there is no plan. And the problem is for us, we, when we approach Marilyn Geyer and we say we're moving forward, we've got to put our property into economic use, we have to make an economic return on this asset, we can't anticipate their timing, we can't anticipate what they might do. Now let me say this. We absolutely need to cooperate with them on whatever the long-term plan is. There are REAs in place. Uh, as you know from the staff report, we went to Maryland Geyer, we got their approval. They have consented to every element of this plan, both from a design and a facade standpoint. They have no issue with it. In fact, they support it. So probably the best evidence in terms of that long-term consistency and that long-term vision is Marilyn Geyer's conclusion that nothing that we are doing is inconsistent with what they may want to do long-term. So I want to just state that as sort of a, an outset issue because I know that the Planning Commission, the City Council, your City Manager is thinking long term about this project. You're thinking of, you know, about what does a new retail mall look like. We're in a major sort of shift in terms of retail, uh, the retail environment in this country. How does this project relate to that? How will, how will we potentially lock ourselves in from doing something that we may want to do later? And the answer is you won't. The answer is you still maintain flexibility. And I think it's important to quote, and I hate quoting in front of commissioners, but I'm going to just do it because I think it's important because it really lends support for what we're saying. The, uh, the general plan policies uh, really do encourage a phase approach to redevelopment of the mall. And that's in your land use plan LU81 uh, in your policy plan. Also in the vision plan. The vision plan states that it's necessary to envision and permit short-term improvements that do not fully achieve the ultimate vision. Uh, that again is in your vision plan. Specific policy 1.9, allow property owners to make modest improvements that will not conflict with the long-term vision for the property. Policy 2.3, a phased approach to redevelopment of the mall. Uh, and again, this is all in your plan. And then even with your most recent zoning code update, which I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, on the legal issue of whether we think this project should apply to that. Our view is that the old zoning code should apply because we were deemed complete before the uh, the new code went into effect. That's our, our legal position, but I don't want to dwell on that. But what I do want to say is even under your new plan, your new plan specifically states that major redevelopment of the mall may require a rezone, plan development, specific plan development agreement, or similar process. We all know how much time that takes. It takes 
two years just to do a facade improvement and a demising, think how much time it's going to take with a, with a long-term plan with development agreement. So those take a lot of time. So I want to just state that at the outset, that we don't believe that anything we are doing will in any manner compromise the city's long-term vision for this asset. Y you maintain that flexibility. These are multiple property ownerships. You've got Macy's, you've got the Coles, you've got Marilyn Geyer, you've got Seritage and Sears. So you've got these multiple interests that are all aligned to make a successful mall. And we all have to work together over time. But that, do that shouldn't mean we should stop. Now, we have to keep these assets moving. We have to keep them productive. We have to keep economic returns coming off of them. Okay, so enough on that topic. Um, I want to just talk briefly about the master sign program. Katie is correct. Uh, we are applying for a master sign program. That allows us the flexibility to go beyond the hard limits of uh, one linear foot, uh, excuse me, one square foot <laughs> per one linear foot into your code, and we're, we're, we're requesting that. Katie acknowledged that our sign is in many respects consistent with other retails in terms of size and scale. I can have our architect talk about some of the more uh, uh, design elements that have been incorporated into the sign element. I want to talk about the, the, the hazardous waste issue for a moment because we obviously, uh, the first time, by the way, we received the letter from the county was when it came in the staff report. We hadn't seen it previously, even though it was issued on, on the 17th. Um, but uh, apparently that was issued at, at Katie's behest because she contacted them and said, what's up with, with site closure? A phase two environmental site assessment, which is in your packet, was completed for the evaluation of the contamination at the uh, former Auto Bay facility. That phase two investigation included the first permit for the removal of the lifts, and then it also included a very extensive subsurface soil investigation for all the other lifts which were subsequently removed. We got a closure letter from the county after that phase two was submitted to the county. Our assumption was, we're closed, we're done, we don't need to do anything further. Now, it appears, and again, we're investigating this, we're trying to figure out what the miscommunication was, it, it appears that the county is now saying that we needed a permit to apply for those subsequent closures. And we're gonna take a look at that. We're not saying we're, we don't have to get that permit. If we have to get that permit, we will get that permit. And we will get the site properly closed under the regulatory oversight of the county. We're committed to doing that. We have to do that. We have to do that for our tenant. We have to do that for a host of reasons. Um, but at least I think the, the, the commission needs to know that in terms of the timing, a, fa a very robust phase two analysis was done. Soil samples were taken of all of the, the beds from the, uh, from the lifts. And that result concluded that the only contamination issue was the original lift that was removed, and that was remediated, fully remediated, and that's all documented and closed by the county. So we're going to look at that issue. Um, on stormwater, I also want to just simply state that, you know, I think, again, we're not making major improvements. We're not altering the infrastructure or the drainage on the site. I think the trigger there is because we're, we're, we're doing the pavers, and that, that fact that we are touching the pavers is apparently triggering new BMPs with respect to stormwater management. That one, I think, as Katie acknowledges, if we have to condition the project on full compliance with BMPs, we are willing uh, to move forward on that basis. I'm gonna now sit down and I wanna bring up other members from our team to answer specific questions on design, pedestrian access, walkability, uh, those sorts of issues, because I think the architect and, and others on the team are the best suited to answer those questions. But obviously, if you have more questions, I'm here and would happy, happily answer those questions. So thank you. Um, yeah, if, he, if he's got a team that wants to speak, I can save him to the end of. Okay. If that's well, okay. I, maybe if you go ahead and, and pose your questions, then they know who to send up and respond to. <laughs> okay. Um, I have five questions. They're pretty straightforward. The first one was um, on the pads that are on the plan identified as phase two. I couldn't. I'm not really good at reading construction plans, so some of these questions may be pretty elementary. But um, I didn't see sidewalk improvements from Capitola Road to the Sears building um, and from 41st to the Sears building, and I don't know if they're included in there and I just missed them, but that was one of my questions. Just, uh, we're gonna answer that question preambular answer. We're moving forward tonight with the demising and the facade improvements uh, for the Sears building. 
as Katie alluded to, we're going to come back on those pads. This is going to be a later a later phase. This is phase two, but we're happy to answer your question. Hi, my name is uh, Craig Chin with ADC. I'm the architect, and I've got the flash drive that's got the whole package. Could I plug it in here and we can look at sure. those exhibits? No, and, and if you just want to say yes or, or no, oh, okay. that would be at this point simple enough for me. Okay. So are there sidewalk? There is, yes. There's that, sidewalk improvements. That come all the way in from the street to the building? The one on Capitola does. The one on 41st does not. Okay. But we enhance that with outdoor patio seating, outdoor plaza, a nice little note on the corner that brings you into an existing path of travel that takes you into the mall property. Okay. Um, and obviously it's a, it's a second thing, but I was wondering if there's any kind of a target in your mind about phase two. Is it... Is it tied to some time after phase one finishes or is there any general? <coughs> Good evening, Blake Carroll with Cypress Equities, development manager for uh, Seritage. So as far as what we had envisioned for phase two, um, the way that it's drawn on the plans currently, it's basically for the pad improvement itself um, to where, you know, we, we would basically install the, complete the site work along with the permit for the uh, building construction, the building permit for the TI essentially for both the, uh, the Petco and TJ Maxx home goods. So we will be required to start that work and make the financial uh, uh, improvement into those pads to where then, I mean, in the future here in the coming months, not too long after we start design for and construction documents for uh, the TI, we'll come back in with full construction document plans and building elevations to get uh, the ultimate design for phase two uh, to approved. So it, it doesn't include the full plans and scope for those pads right now, <coughs> um, but so we would be coming back in to get that finalized. So you're looking at a matter of a year or two years? Not even that years. long. I mean, okay. we're, we're talking, you know, I mean, we would, it's, it's in our best interest to have that project, those pads, be a continuous project to where we don't do the site work and then let it sit for a long period of time. It would be in our best interest to complete that site work and have it flow straight into vertical construction for the pads. Okay. So um, really these pads were added as uh, to comply with the overall general plan at, at the request from staff and, and uh, uh, city. And, you know, we're happy to do it. Um, you know, just trying to figure out the, obviously the immediate goal to get the approval for uh, the retenancy for the Sears box. Um, we view this as a condition to be able to, to do that. And um, this was the first step of that phase two. Can I ask a good clarification sidewalk sure. question? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, in, in front, the, main, the front of the Sears building, you come down and there's an entrance into off of Capitola Road and you have one of your phase two pads there. So I'm confused about whether the new sidewalk that's going in there with the bike lane, is that part of phase two or is that part of phase one? Phase one. The bike lane would be part of phase one, which means you'd have to move the sidewalk there's, there's two bike lanes off of Capitola. The one to the, there's one on the closer to the corner by the bank building. There's one further away from that. There's, so there's two coming in. One off of 38th and then the one right. next to B, B of A. <coughs> so those new sidewalks would go in as part of phase one. Sorry, yes, one would. So the one on 38th would be part of phase one. The, the one on 40th is part of phase two that would tie in with the site work that we would be doing for that pad. Okay. So one is phase two and one is phase one. Okay, got for it. For the bike lane, but, but the sidewalk that doesn't exist doesn't exist on 40th today. There is a sidewalk that goes in on 38th. Right. Correct. Okay. 
just oh any site okay got it And if I might add, that's part of the pedestrian experience when you go in there, because right now it's double lanes of parking, so you're actually backing in to what is currently 40th, 40th. So by adding the bike lane and adding the sidewalk, it's actually making it safer than what it would be if you just put a bike lane in there with the parking the way it's striped. So we've adjusted a lot of that area there to make it a lot more pedestrian friendly. So when you're coming in off of Capitola, you get as close to the Sears building and close to the mall as you possibly can without interfering on the greater side of the parking right right and I guess my my point in asking the question was I thought that's what I was understanding that that sidewalk which is going to be a, a main a major improvement in our pedestrian experience isn't in phase one it's in phase two and there is enough room to put it in and the bike lane where you you've drawn it and you guys have have looked at that yep. okay um, in our conceptual review meeting, we talked a lot about the gathering places and specifically that corner where there's currently a great big planter um, by the Sears building. And when I was looking through the packet, there was a reference to that planter and it said um, to refer to A13R for the planter dimensions and the landscaping detail and there was no A13R. So I'm wondering if you have any detail on what's going to happen in that corner. Um, did that get a lot of focus or? It, it, it did. So we actually have certain nodes going through the building um, all the way around, starting from the left corner where Petco is. We have a, a, our first node there with new planning, new, new benches. And then as you walk along, there's these new nodes every 150 feet, something like that, 100 feet. So you've got, as you're walking along, you can see where your next spot's going to be, whether you're going to park <coughs> right there or sit down or there's going to be new enhanced landscaping. So we've really created that. So on that corner where we've enhanced it, we've added new paving. And if you look at sheet A4.2, it shows kind of a diagram of that. Okay. And the idea was to create it where you're going to have bench style seating. So as you're sitting there waiting for people or joining other people, there's activities that you can sit there adding in a, a better shade <coughs> tree that provides better shade for the pedestrians as they're in that area. Okay. So you're, you're talking about the area right along Correct, the, yes. the front of the road. Okay. Yep. And, okay. Then, and then past that, as you look through there, you can, you can see there's, either enhanced paving or there's new planters that are proposed so there's always something else happening and everything is is designed to be at a pedestrian scale so we don't have really contextual or really highly textural elements really high up in the air we have them lower where people can see them and experience them so the pavers the wall the uh, the wood that's on the side the the stone that's now on the side where you can touch it all the planters are are seatable so you can sit there so the whole idea is to create you know, really a pedestrian friendly environment as you go through, even though it's only three stores and three, um, three main tenants, as you're walking through there, you really get a different feeling as you're going through from the tenants <coughs> frontages to the void spaces, which are now enhanced with paving and planters and green screen. So there's always something happening. It's not big blank walls like there is now. Okay. And it's low. Um, and that leads right into the next question. The, the material, the, the green walls behind the benches. Um, I couldn't find any reference to what those really were. And, and tonight I signed Katie's presentation that, that we think those are trellises. Can you, can you tell us what those are? Yeah, so it's, a, it's really meant to be a green screen. So it's gonna be, um, if you've seen them traditionally, they are a mesh of metal that the, the grow, the, the type of plant material that grow and they move will go in between there and get forced to be in that area. And then we just, we just landscape and prune them to stay in that square area. Okay. So it's meant to grow through this, not a, um, not a vine that's going to crawl up a wall. It's actually in a cage, and the cage helps direct where it's going to go. So you don't have it coming up over the building and going sideways. It's really meant to be manicured and, and kept in a certain space. Okay. I'm not familiar with those. It sounds like a pretty beautiful thing. Yeah, they're, they're <coughs> nice because they, can, they, can con they control it better. Okay. Last question. Um, and I think I'm right when I say the north side of the Sears building. Um, which is on the main entrance into the mall. So if you walk straight in, 
I didn't see anything on that wall. Is that wall just going to stay the way it is, or is it going to? Yeah. So that that wall, yeah, it's that yes. little section right there. So our building is actually right on the property line. So we're not able to actually build anything over it. So what we're doing is enhancing it with different paint. In, in areas where we can add other material, we can do that, but it's very, very, there, there's no room. So we weren't enhancing that like we were everything else because we just don't have the space to do that. Are the windows gonna be opened um, so there's some transparency there or are they gonna be covered up? As, I mean, right now it's, it's a pretty ugly scene walking dark, down there. Yeah. I, I don't know what Sears plans are for that. And those are my questions. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, so with that, you get want to go ahead and conclude your uh, presentation? And Can I um, just go through a few of Katie's points that she brought up? Certainly. Okay. <coughs> So this is, this is a great one just to leave up here. So the connectivity to the mall, uh, as we discussed in previous meetings, it's impossible to get TJ Maxx or Petco to get access to the mall because where Sears is, you have to get to their loading dock, which is on the far left-hand side. So at one point we discussed putting loading docks in a different area and the answer was no, we don't want loading docks off of Capitola or off of 41st. So our only option is to keep it where it is in that back truck loading dock corridor. And once we do that, it kind of eliminates just by the design of it, getting direct access to it. But what we did create is this pedestrian friendly zone starting from Petco all the way through and around that space. So while we don't have direct access to the mall, we, have, we do have great, a great experience going around the property to get into the mall. Uh, the connectivity to get to Target we discussed in, in numerous meetings, it's, it's impossible to do now because of ADA. It's <coughs> not, the, the slope and cross slope is too steep where if we provide a path there, we're gonna get hit with um, accessibility issues because you just can't get there. It's physically impossible to get there with the grading that we have now. So we can't connect that because once we connect it, we have to provide accessible path to travel there. And we, we frankly can't do it physically, it's impossible. And then the, the parking areas, I don't remember, I wrote that down, but you had a comment on the parking areas in your, oh. in your presentation. The parking areas? Yeah. I, I know that I had re requested just a sheet that would lay out exactly your calculation for parking. Oh, okay. Areas, so but, and number them for me, because there's a lot of uh, property lines that overlap. So on the, cover, on the cover sheet, we have a parking matrix. So if you, if you zoom in, it's kind of in the center. Yeah, right to the right, you'll see parking calculations. And so what we did, because we're really looking at three different ways to, to get the parking. One is what's required by code. Two is what is required by the REA. And the REA is actually more stringent than what your code is. And then what we're providing. And what we're providing with phase one and phase two. So if you go to the very bottom, with the two pads, even if we did them as restaurant, we still have we still have ample ample parking to provide. So, is what you're asking that we need to go through and label every stall on there, or does this suffice for for what you need? Um, so, in my in my second incomplete letter, I was simply just asking for a site plan to have each your numbers identified on parking spaces, so I could see what was some of the property lines kind of bisect parking spaces. So just so that I could second check the work and make sure that you have exactly what was shown in these tables, but I don't okay. want to get into complete and incomplete items. Oh, I just think we could do that as a, we could have that as a condition, right? It doesn't have to be something. I, I was unable to determine based okay. on the plans that were submitted. Yeah. Uh, then open space and public space was one of your comments as well. And I think if you go to the site plan, we've enhanced as much open space as we can in phase one. Uh, phase two, we provided a lot more open spaces where the two uh, 4,000 square foot pads are going to be. We have outdoor plazas, we have outdoor seatings, we have connectivity from the public sector all the way through the property. So we provided as much 
open space, public space that we can do on a really tight site like this. I think that's that's it for me. Thank you. What well, maybe I had a question uh, also. I mean, concerning access and connectivity. Um, just what's the rationale for being part of a mall? There's no access to the mall from the in interior of these uh, premises. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, it's it's really because of where Sears is. With Sears being where they are getting to the loading dock, it prohibits us from getting access to there. And you see this happening, I would say, in a lot of malls um, across the country where these big boxes are getting redeveloped and redemised where they only have access from the outside, mm -hmm. whether it's a restaurant or a gym or you know a TJ Maxx. A lot of those no longer have access directly to the mall because they the way they operate and the way they brand and the way they do their their operation is only from one entrance. So it's it's traditional to see this happening as these big boxes get turned over. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything further? Um. We're here to answer any additional questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, is there any other member of the public that would like to address the commission on this item? Um, Seeing none, I'll close the microphone, but uh, recognizing that there may be more questions for the applicant. Yes, Katie. Um, I would like to make a clarification that stormwater with the phase one, phase two pads would have to incorporate, that, that, that is part of this proposal, the phases. And under CEQA, we cannot review a project in pieces. You must look at the whole project. So for stormwater, um, stormwater has to address these future phases as well as we would be looking at um, the development and circulation and traffic also so regarding that to do our CEQA analysis. I, I have a question, Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Um, given that, can we or can uh, the applicant do the appropriate stuff for to meet CEQA but that change in the phase two? In other words, I don't know that if we, I don't know that we really know what we want in that whole phase two component yet. So can that, can they meet what and make it compliant with CEQA today sure, and they, then change they, that in the future? They could build in stormwater improvements to bring it into compliance knowing where those buildings are okay. going to be sited. <coughs> if I might, um, a little bit of history on the phase two pads. Um, they were really never part of this project. They were requested to be included in a subsequent application by staff, but they are not part of what you are approving. Without the pads and without Katie and staff's acknowledgement that stormwater is potentially impacted by the development of those pads, if they're not part of this project, which they really shouldn't be considered part of, part of the project, the project is exempt from CEQA. There's a very clear exemption. Your city attorney can advise you on this with respect to existing buildings, demising, facade improvements. This project is exempt under CEQA. And so my recommendation is take the pads out. The pads sh should not be part of this project. They were included at staff's request faithfully by the applicant, but you're not approving anything tonight with respect to the, to the out parcels. So let's just, let's just not approve anything, take those out, and this project should be deemed exempt under CEQA. Very simple. I, I have just a little to you. comment. Yeah. You know, Mr. Waite, uh, one of the things in this process is you, you brought up, you, you read our general plan, you brought up some of the components of, uh, that are expected in our general plan. That's a phase process, I get that. We take small increments, I get that. But part of it is that vision. And, and so what we asked for, it wasn't staff, it was this planning commission asked for that vision. What, do you, what is a long-term um, plan for this and that's that's why those pads are there today because we wanted to see where that's at and, and I think part of that also goes back to this how we work together because I think communication is a big part of where we're going with the vision you 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 folks have 200 plus years projects they throughout the nation that you're, you're working on this 40 of them in California this isn't new to you I this you have these projects going through every mall so while it may be new to us I guess we want to depend a little bit on uh, your experience through this process, but some of that takes, uh, I hate some trust in that process. And so I think for, I can speak for me, I wanted to see 
do you have a vision to help us meet our general plan? Because this is what our general plan was, was calling for. So I wanna help you get through this first phase. Uh, me as an individual, I, I can't speak for my other commissioners up here. And that concept, that vision of the phase two is, is part of that moving forward through the process. So however we can work out sequel, we have an attorney, you you're apparently have this experience. I think that's great, but we need to see that. I need to see that to feel comfortable and move forward. And, that, and that's a fair comment. And I think for that reason in good faith, it was included so that you do have some sense of what the long-term vision is. Right. But again, there's no approval with respect to that component. It's really provided Understood. to give you the roadmap down the road for what is to come. And as Blake alluded to, it will come but right now we're trying to get these tenants approved and get them in these spaces and as to that that project that is really before you it is exempt under CEQA and I think I would hope that the staff and city attorney would concur on that on that view well, we'll trust him to figure that out thank you and if I may um, I just want to express that uh, I, I think I personally have as much interest in um, seeing something happen there sooner than later. <laughs> I'm no longer interested in tying this to Malone Geyer and waiting for them. Um, but with that said, um, from your viewpoint, what's, what's the difference of whether we were to approve this project with conditions that have been identified by staff, which you would have to meet in any event, or to deny the current application without prejudice and have you then continue to work with the staff to resolve those questions. Um, and I would personally express, I, I would like to see this move along as quickly as possible. Um, and to have us, because we all have the same interest here, um, and to have us try to work together um, to make this happen. Um, and so, I mean, from your perspective, what's, what's the distinction here? What's the best thing that we could do to move this project forward? And acknowledging that we have these deficiencies currently that are, that are gonna have to be addressed. Yeah, I think you put your, your finger on it. There, at this point, we've been at it for a couple of years now. Uh, we think the time is right to move this project forward. Uh, we think that unquestionably, staff can make the CEQA exemption that's required by law. Unquestionably, we can condition the project. This is a discretionary approval. Planning Commission has the discretion to condition the project based upon clearance from the county on environmental. If there is, in fact, BMP that needs to be incorporated into stormwater, you can impose that condition as well. If there are any other conditions that you want to see implemented before building permits are issued, you absolutely have that discretion. But that's moving the project forward. To, to say, no, we're gonna deny you, start over, come back again, file a new application, that's number three. We're now at number three, application number three. Let's move forward. Let's move forward with what we have. And if, if the Planning Commission is, is concerned about items that have been brought up by staff that feel require additional attention, let's, let's put those conditions in and we will deal with those. We will ensure that they are complied with and staff will, will make sure that we comply with those conditions before we can get building permits issued. But that's moving the project forward, which is really what we're asking for this evening. So are, are we done with the public part? Or are we gonna do our commission thing or? Oh, we will, yeah, we will. I, I, yeah, I think that we're done. Uh, we were just at this point posing questions to the applicant. Um, they were gracious to answer them. And so uh, if there are no further questions from commissioners uh, to the applicant, I will bring this back and um, we'll uh, you know, discuss it and take some action. So who wants to start? You do. Well, I, I, you, I it sounds like you already <laughs> started. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for me, um, this project never was about uh, you know, working completely with Malone Geyer. This project for me was the first project that was coming in that related to our new general plan that we had adopted. And, um, you know, sort of the goals and visions that we had uh, in that general plan. And um, I agree with Commissioner Walsh. I thought when we had the conceptual review, 
that, uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about was, uh, you know, not just approving something on this one building, but what was going to happen on their entire property that was going to move forward the, the goals and desires that had been outlined in our, in our general plan. And, um, uh, you know, for, for me, I think there has been, uh, you know, some tremendous improvement as far as, uh, you know, the Sears building itself and how it looks. Um, as far as the Petco and the TJ Maxx, it seems to me that both of those are, you know, uh, a long way away of, uh, from as far as a design standard from, um, you know, tying this all together and doing a major Im improvement. Um, I asked the question about, you know, the sidewalks and the connectivity because, again, to me, um, you know, putting in some new sidewalks and the bike lanes and that uh, should be part of any project that's going to go forward now. Um, I do have some, some great concerns about some of the technical aspects of the project. Uh, I mean, county environmental health, in my opinion, is basically another department within the city of Capitola because we contract with them to do that kind of work for us. And, um, you know, if an applicant came in and said, well, you know, we haven't con um, gotten the necessary permits we need to get from your public works department to uh, uh, do something, I think we would be quite concerned about that. And for me, uh, there's no difference between them uh, clearing up the work that they need to do with county environmental health before they go forward. Um, I, I have, um, you know, concerns about, uh, you know, the environment and CEQA and how all of that's going to work. And they say, oh, well, just approve this little part of the project you know, sort of trust us that when phase two comes in, then we'll, we'll work on that when, you know, I, I thought we were going to get an application coming in that was going to be an application regarding, um, you know, some future improvements that were gonna happen on the whole site that would work to, you know, achieve the goals that we wanted to have in, in our general plan. So, um, uh, you know, I, I want to hear from my other commissioners, but I at this point for me, um, you know, I don't see this being at a place where, you know, I'm, I would be willing to say, you know, I would recommend approval of this tonight with conditions because uh, frankly, you know, I, I think there uh, are some, some issues that need to be worked out. Um, you know, the planning commission does have the option of um, you know denying a project without prejudice, which means that they could you know come back in any time with it, um, or um, you know one of the things I, I would like to find out from the staff because in our new zoning regulations, um, which um, you know I'll let the attorneys fight about, but I believe our new zoning regulations do apply to this project. Um, you know, we're supposed to have some sort of specific plan or something to, to, to work with even on, on this site. So, um, you know, I, uh, for me, there, there are still so many unanswered questions that, that I would be hard pressed to approve this with conditions tonight. I'm gonna, yeah. Thank um, you, Susan. with your permission, agree with a lot of the things that you said and add to a little bit. Sure. Um, when we did the conceptual review, we talked about um, redevelopment versus remodeling, and we talked about the Sears building. Um, yes, we want to see how it all ties into the overall, but given that we're not going to get there with that, if I saw the building being redeveloped instead of new facades on one side that don't match the beautiful new facade on the other side, and one whole side that's in a main corridor of entry into the mall that's not, not really being touched, um, then I would think that 
we were being heard in wanting the development to move forward towards our vision. It doesn't all have to be done today, but the connectivity issue is a, is a big one in our mind. And if you look all over the state of California, pedestrian friendly is critical to the economic development in different areas. I was watching something on Seaside on the news just tonight before I came to this meeting about Seaside, um, you know, redoing their downtown and the pedestrian friendliness of the area is critical because that's what people need. I went and I, I drove by the Sears building today and I looked hard at all of the different elements and I tried to figure out how I could approve the the first phase of the plan and I I just can't get there from the pedestrian perspective I know that the truck egress and ingress is a big deal and I looked at the plans and I understand the um, <coughs> what you said about the grading and I hadn't I hadn't really thought about that between Target and the Sears building but people do walk that way and by taking out the curbs and and the um, the bulb out landscaping that's there, it's actually gonna become more dangerous because people coming out of that parking building up by Target are gonna come down that way and there's gonna be a much wider spot for vehicle traffic to come peeling down there and people do use that corridor to get from place to place. Um, there was a guy out there walking his dog and I thought, what what's gonna happen when all of that, um, that corners off that parking area is gone and it's all just flat concrete it's going to be it's going to be scary and i think it's going to introduce some pedestrian issues that we don't have today so it actually doesn't take us towards our vision in that arena it, it takes us a step back um, we were clear about the opportunities of working in a phased approach and independently and what I was really hoping we would see would be a, an approach, a, a, a plan that had a phased approach that didn't just throw two, pid, two pads out there because that's what we want to see, but that actually showed us in the design, in the, in the application, that there was a plan and a thought of how we were going to move forward. Um, and our vision is really clear. We were, we're not saying anything different tonight than we said in the conceptual review, and that was even discussed prior to that. The architectural features have made a lot of improvements, but I don't see the gathering place. I don't see that people are gonna come to that planner and hang out on the curb. I, that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for a, a maybe a little cafe kind of environment of, of seating chairs where um, if you go over and you look at um, some of the different areas in town that have sidewalk environments that are attractive, that do bring people in, they're not planners that I can't even see how they're gonna be seating areas. So what we've communicated is that we want the mall area to create a sense of place a place to gather, a place to shop, a place to eat. And the Sears building can do all of those things by itself. It just, in this, in this application, I don't see it doing those things. Um, the goals and policies, the revisioning plan, all of those are really clear. They may include facade changes, but they shall not conflict with the ultimate direction. And unfortunately, in this case, the, the pedestrian element is, in my mind, in conflict. So I don't know how I could support this one tonight. I don't know what kind of conditions I would have to put on it um, to change that. The, the technical ones, I could trust staff to write some conditions for those if they saw their way through to do that, but from a design perspective, if Marlone Geyer didn't exist on this planet, I'd still have a really hard time supporting this project. Thank you, Belinda. TJ? Yeah. Well, I was hoping my uh, fellow commissioner at the end would go first, but 
What the heck, I'll jump in there. I, I always have something to say. Um, I, I think uh, it's uh, the design review, if we're just talking about design first, has come tremendously a, a long ways and um, more than I think just putting lipstick on a pig. I think for me, um, it's, it's in the ballpark. Now, I always confer with my wife, believe it or not, because I want to have a happy home. And uh, she's not wild about the Petco colors or the Petco walls, to be honest with you, she's not. So she concurs with uh, some of our fellow commissioners here. But um, I'm all for getting this project going. Personally, I want to see the tenants in there. I don't want to see th that area you go through there now. It's a blighted industry. It's just terrible to go through there. Um, I don't have a big issue with the pedestrian part. There's only one way access in the mall currently is through the Sears building. So. That interconnectability, if you, if you uh, again, I, I mentioned I have a wife and I, and I have to do some traveling, which means I have to do some shopping. The new environment isn't this indoor mall. In fact, if you went to the uh, um, Guyer Malone uh, preview, that whatever we, we called that, which by the way was really disappointing, uh, and you can put that on the record, um, that that's what people want. People wanted that building opened up. They don't want to see that closed in mall. So I think the outdoor experience, uh, I think the sidewalks, I think what we're asking is you, the way I see this is you have basically your hands tied as far as the building. I, I don't think as a city we can ask you to tear down and start from scratch because we could really do something there. Um, I think given what you have, excuse me, what you have, I think in some tenants in there is a great deal. I think the vision of the phases uh, are appropriate. Um, you know, in the in your back of your um, plans there, you have some sketches of some bistros and stuff. And I, I think those are appropriate type things. I didn't see an In-N-Out Burger in there, but um, I saw some things I think are appropriate for uh, those phases. For me, it gave the vision. Um, I guess for me, it, it, I, I have no problem moving forward personally with, with this project under some conditions. Uh, obviously, the ESA and the BMPs are something that we, we have to resolve. I don't see those as being overwhelming. I don't see them as a stop block. I just think that something has to be resolved. Um, but what I would like to see, um, is I think um, one of my commissioners, fellow commissioners brought up the specific plan concept. And I know you guys are involved in the New Park Mall, which I think has the same type of concept, that we have a, a way of moving forward through these other phases uh, with more people involved than, than you guys just throwing pictures at us. And maybe that's done through city staff. I don't, I don't really know, but um, I think we need to have more discussion there. Um, what else can I talk about? Uh, we talked about the architectural style. I don't, I don't know how you make it. I, I'm sure someone can make it prettier. My wife thinks she can make it prettier for you, but I don't have a big heartburn. Petco is Petco. Um, it's got some certain colors with it. How you design that, I don't know. Um, that that routing to get the trucks through there, I think is, is a, it handicaps us as far as um, what we do with the pe pedestrian thoroughfare to the target. Well, we talked about the elevation. I, I, I would think looking at getting those trucks um, through the 38th entrance around in front of Petco and around the corner. It seems to me we could open up uh, an entrance in between Takar and the, the parking structure and make that an easier thoroughfare for um, deliveries and stuff, but that's just something that's on the side. Um, I talked about a little bit about communication, and I, I, I don't know that um, I think uh, Seritage fell sh a little short on communicating with our staff during the process from the time this project started conceptual till uh, they got this letter that helped us get this on the, the plant the agenda for tonight. I think you fell short of, of communicating. I think we should be able to uh, fix that. Um, for me, when we look at the general plan, the big, the big concern is this 40th Avenue corridor. Um, I think you took some steps in by putting the bike lanes and, and opening that up, and I understand that that may come to a second phase area, but I think that's something we really need to focus on. It's part of our general plan. It's something that we want to see. I don't think we can hang on uh, and, and wait for a, a Merlone guy or two to jump into this, but we can certainly work on that area that you have uh, a, a purview over 
coming in off of Capitola Road. So I think I've pretty much addressed my issues. I don't, I honestly, I don't have a lot of big things I could move forward if we could get past some of the, this conditioning. Ed? So <coughs> I'm not gonna be lengthy here because I think we need to talk about what kind of action to take, spend some time on that. Uh, I'm impressed by what the team has done here with at least the Sears building for sure, mm -hmm. and some of the uh, some of the grounds. And at the same time, I'm disappointed uh, with what we have here and with the effort or lack of effort that was made to uh, comply with sort of the direction that we provided uh, 18 months ago. The, it is the elephant to me that's the concern here. Um, and that's what we said at the time of the conceptual hearing that before we gave up on the idea that there could be some form of integrated redevelopment of the mall, we at least had to make uh, an effort. And I don't see that the effort has really been made here. And uh, I'll, I'll just touch on that briefly, but um, it's the general plan that I spent three years chairing to uh, uh, have enacted in Capitola that isn't um, being, I think, really advanced by this project. And it's the lack of integration with um, the rest of the properties there. So the, the team told us that there are some features that are impossible to deal with. You can't uh, deal with the um, connectivity to the west and you can't deal with the connectivity in the mall. Well, that's the point. If it's done piece by piece, yes, those are impossible. But if there's some overall vision that can be advanced, then maybe they, those aren't impossible. And at some point, we may have to give up the ghost on this, I know. But I, I just don't think I'm ready at this point to do that. Um, I don't think that the Petco and EJ Max buildings as drawn um, meet the requirement of the general plan in terms of um, maintaining the unique coastal character of Capitola. They seem to me like they're not at all um, consistent with Capitola's character, but maybe that can't be helped, I don't know. But in Mr. Waite's letter, he said, that the approval of the application will in no way interfere with or impair future redevelopment of the mall. And then he goes on to say that it will create jobs and taxes, but I didn't, that was a non sequitur to me. I mean, I don't see how it doesn't impair the future redevelopment of the mall because it creates jobs and taxes right now. So that goes back to the point I made that I think that's the big issue. And I think what we need to talk about, because I think there's, there aren't enough votes to approve this tonight. Let me put it that way. So I think after we hear from the chairman, we should kind of spend some time on what the proper action is. Yeah, and, and I won't belabor this either so that we can get to the substance of the evening. Um, but I'll have to say that um, I, I've had a lot of frustration with this project, and it's not about Saratoj. It's about Malone Geyer. Um, and it seems to me that we've been <coughs> put in the place and we're, uh, it's the classic case of, of sacrificing the better for the best. Um, and, and I'm not sure if we're g ever going to get uh, what our vision was uh, that we uh, developed. There's already a part of the vision in the general plan about 40th Avenue, and Malone Geyer has already expressed to us they're not going to do that. Um, so I think that we have to let go of some of that vision and look at where we are and then try to move forward. Take a step. Um, and I, in, in, uh, you know, on the designs, um, some of them I like, some of them I don't like. I think that's kind of subjective. I think there's a lot of forces that go behind creating these designs, these businesses. They know what's best to attract customers and, um, and to generate sales, and that's in essence what I, I think ultimately this is about, is a commercial place um, and for uh, citizens of the community to be able to go into these shops and, um, 
and get the things that they need. Um, so um, I've been frustrated about how, I, I guess, complex and difficult this has become. I'm in a position of being prepared uh, to uh, move this forward in some way. Um, and, and if we wanted to have ARC and Psych or design uh, conditions placed on it, then maybe we could do that. I would be willing to do that, um, just so that we can start to move forward with something um, instead of just perpetually letting it languish um, to me, which is another danger, because if you don't do something, it could languish, and, and then it is a slippery slope, um, and you, know, you lose your customer base, uh, and you may never recover from that, regardless of how fabulous of a facility you create. Um, so I'm interested in movement. I'm interested in things, things happen there, different things happening there. I think that that's what would attract the community attention, seeing something happening there. Um, but so that's, that's you know, I, I think my uh, personal opinion on it. But with that said, maybe we should talk about, because I, I don't see the votes here this evening. Uh, to to carry that, but maybe we could talk about uh, how we want to structure um, an action on this on this item. Yeah, and I, 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 I will say I think w how we want to structure an action that's going to, you know, allow something to ultimately happen. It just needs to be, you know, um, a, a process for how. Mm -hmm. you know. uh, can I ask, can I just ask what, what would be the expectation of the change for those three occupancies? What, what do you want to see different? I, I, I don't know how we, we um, set an expectation without tying Marlon Geyer to this, and, and quite frankly, I don't think we can, and, I, and I'm tired of waiting for them. I, I think uh, if we do that, we're going to... This project came in to me, and, you know, Marlon Geyer hadn't bought them all. I still would not approve what they have presented here tonight. Okay, that's, I, I can accept I that. But I'm asking, what would you want to see different? What's going to change that to get that through? Because I don't, I don't understand what would, is it design, the, re, the, the looks of the buildings? What, what, is, what, is, what would you like to see well, that would get it through? First of all, I think the, the process needs to, to be followed properly. And I think, uh, you know, the technical issues need to be dealt that with. Totally understood, yeah. Saying, that's well, understood. You didn't mm -hmm. say this is not complete in your letter, so you know we're we're here before you, um, uh, and I think maybe um, Commissioner Newman has some ideas about you know what action we could take or we should talk about that. That um, <coughs> my impression is from the way this has come to us, uh, which is perfectly okay that the applicant who's been at this a long time has forced it with the Permit Streamlining Act and asserted their rights mm -hmm. and as they have a right to do. I think a denial to go back and redesign and do this and do that is not, is not consistent with that uh, at this point. I think I would prefer just a denial and an, uh, an appeal. Uh, if that's the way they want to go with it from my standpoint. And the reason for my denial would not be as much the technical issues as the uh, lack of compliance with the general plan. And so can I ask you, wh where do you think the lack of compliance is at? Well, the idea is. I can give you some. Answer. No, good. I'd like, <laughs> no, because I want to hear them because. I obviously I studied the general plan. I looked at it thoroughly, and I get the pedestrian uh, discussion. We talked about the the bike. I get that whole, but d based on just this project, if we put through that 40th Avenue and and they were consistent with doing that, and doing the uh, gathering places with the bistros and stuff that they, where do you how do you see this? Not I, I'm not following what you're saying. They oh so on the last page of their plans. Yeah, on the pads? Yeah, they have the concepts of the pads with the outdoor dining. They have the 40th Avenue going through there. You have the bike ways going through there. So and that's not part of this application. Right. And they've made it they very said clear. That. They, they, they only want to talk about 
the tenant improvements? Well, I guess where I'm at is that is a condition for me I have written right here is that, is that that is part of this. We'll move this project on with this concept that they're going to move forward. And I think we heard tonight that. But then, then said, we do have to deal with the environmental review issue. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think you can make a finding that you don't have to do environmental review for the project at that point. You do. I, I guess I would, is that what our attorney says? You, you, cannot, um, you cannot piecemeal a project under CEQA. On the other hand, um, <coughs> CEQA requires that a project have enough definition before you go forward that you can analyze the, um, the impacts of it. So if you were um, inclined <coughs> to, uh, to, to uh, approve the project with the pads, um, I think what you would do is uh, is um, you'd have to we'd have to do the uh, environmental review. If you approve the project without the pads and condition the project with the amenities that come along with the second phase in the first phase, make them part of the project, the, the first phase project, instead of waiting for the second phase, then I think the uh, piecemeal issue goes away. Okay. Does that work or is that, you still have No, issues? I just want to throw in some, um, a couple of cents if I can, <coughs> just because I'm, I'm watching this bounce back and forth between you and them and I'm getting in the middle of it now. <laughs> um, we've been at this a long time too. We've been thinking about it, we've been looking at it, we've been talking to you guys for a long time. And it's, it's not clear to me that, I'm, I'm just gonna put it out there, okay? What I see when I look at this project is a, um, you know, slap some paint on it, throw up a couple of, of things to satisfy two new tenants and give us lip service for what they think we want to hear and let's get it approved, let's move it on. And I'm really ready on the other end of the spectrum from moving it forward to say stop. And this is the, the second time we've, we've had this discussion. We haven't made much progress. I don't see a lot of changes from what I saw in the concept review. I know that there are some, there's some landscaping, but in the, in the bigger picture, it's not moving towards the vision. I guess I, and I'm not them, I don't understand what your vision is at the end because if I look, and it's very subjective, I guess, but if I look at the general plan and I look at what they've given us as far as that vision in the future, to me, I think they're, they're right on board. So I guess maybe it's me that's missing it, but I, I don't see that. So if we deny this project without prejudice, that means that they can go back. I mean, it's, it's in some ways it's close to continuing it because they're not restricted to not being able to come back for another year. They, they need to, they can go back and, you know, develop their plan and come back with it at any time that they want. I mean, they're, they're, we would it need, need at least one more full meeting to go through coming up with conditions in my mind that we would have to place on this project um, I mean there's there's not adequate landscaping plans I don't understand you know the trellises which are the main things uh, going on their building uh, you know we, we don't have that information tonight so uh, you know I think we're at a place tonight where um, you know we, we need to deny the project uh, the question is, do we do it with or without prejudice? And I go back to my thing. I, I, don't, I don't understand why there can't be, you know, some sort of specific plan for sort of this area, this property, how, how, how it's going to, to work. I mean, we talked about that in our new zoning regulations. That was one of the things that we wanted because if we had that, then we could see how this was all going to evolve and work together. And um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't know if staff has any ideas about, um, you know, going down that kind of, of road. 
If, if the project were denied without prejudice, they could come back in in the next month or two with a similar application with all the items that you requested this evening. If it was a denial um, with prejudice, just straight denial, they would not be able to resubmit an application for a one-year period. In that time, you could, of course, direct staff to start working on a specific plan and the, to, for the city to initiate it. And in, under that scenario, we would be working with the property owner. You know, we'd come back to you with the details of what that would look like. At this juncture, I can't tell you exactly what that would look like, but it would be a, some type of a, a, an effort to work within the mall property towards a specific plan to capture that vision. So, so we, off, okay. we often um, send applicants back a, sure. a denial to come back in a short <coughs> period of time with changes. I don't think that this project fits that mold because they have forced the issue and it, deliberately because they want to get decisive action here. And so I think that we should give them that, whether it's an approval with conditions or a denial, and then let them move uh, ahead with whatever uh, remedies they have, which is the city council, of course, and get this thing resolved. Because it is, the, to me, it's the bigger issue. It's not the drainage issue. Right. So can, can I ask, so if we deny it without prejudice, that doesn't eliminate them still appealing. No, the they still have their to uh, the city council. Correct. They would have two options then, right. which would be to come back to the planning commission with your su suggested, or go straight to the city council on an appeal. I think it would be better to uh, move this uh, up to the city council. Okay. Well, I'm going to call for a motion then at this time. Somebody want to make a motion? Well, I'll jump in there because I was ready to approve it on condition. So if we're if we're not going to get there, which it looks like we're not, then I would say we um, deny it um, without prejudice, and uh, they could bring it back to us. I, I you know just just to clarify a little bit, I I hate to not do what I feel like is our <coughs> our due diligence and just punt to the city council. I think that this is what we're here for and so for me i'd like to see us complete this project before it goes to the city council so i'd make a motion that we deny it uh, without prejudice and there's a motion yes john uh, uh, commissioner newman and commissioner westman both indicated that they had uh, general plan concerns that might not been re have reflected in the agenda report and it would be good for staff to hear those so we could uh, include those reasons for denial which are the commission's reasons for denial in any resolution we prepare that would go up to the city council. Mine are included in the staff report. Okay. Pretty much. Yeah. Do you yeah. have any that aren't included? Okay. Uh, mine, mine are pretty much in there. Uh, I, you know, it's sort of the um, uh, the public access, the pedestrian use, the si sidewalks, the connectivity. You know, I don't think those are in, in this particular application. Okay. There's a motion. Uh, is there a second? Going. Can we make another motion? Well, if motion? well, if nobody seconds that, that one's going to fail. So okay. then we will have another motion. I hear no <coughs> second, so the motion fails. Uh, Greg, do you want to? You go. <laughs> it's always me. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll make a motion to deny the project. I'll second it. C clarification, that's without um, any indication of with prejudice or without prejudice? Uh, that's with prejudice. That's with prejudice. So there's a motion and a second. Um, I'm going to call for um, a roll call vote. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Welch? No. Commissioner Westman? Yes. Chairperson Story? No. The motion passes three to two. 
That brings us to item six, which is the director's report. No report this evening. Okay. Um, and finally, it's commission communications. Any uh, communications? So we've communicated we've enough this evening. It's nice, <laughs> nice to have John here tonight. Uh, Hello again. Yes. yes. Thanks, John. Thanks, thanks for being here, John. Um, with that, um, I'll adjourn this meeting uh, to the um, July. Um.